All right, folks, we're a little tardy in getting started. Apologies, that's uh, that's my bad. Um, but uh, welcome. Uh, this is the 486th, that's hard to believe, 486th meeting of the National Science Board. So we're now convened at, uh, uh, at 10.06 uh, Eastern Time on November 29th, uh, 2003. Uh, you all know the drill. This is a hybrid meeting. We've got some folks in person and some folks on Zoom, and all the sessions are being streamed on the Foundation's uh, <clears throat> excuse me, YouTube channel. Again, just a reminder, housekeeping, if you're here in person, uh, be sure you're logged into the Zoom today, but keep your, uh, your speakers, your microphone, and your video off um, and to prevent feedback, uh, and we'll monitor, of course, the Zoom uh, and raise your hand if you're on Zoom, uh, and likewise in the room, uh, so we can recognize people. Um, I want to turn to a couple of quick uh, um, um, Science Board office updates as a beginning. The first one is we uh, we want to welcome uh, Andrew Zidell. Andrew, are you you here? Stand up. <laughs> Uh, he's a AAAS Science and Technology Fellow. Uh, he's just uh, joined the board office. He's a physicist, uh, joined us in September from the American Institute of Physics. And during his fellowship, Andrew will work on uh, a whole variety of things, uh, including supporting the uh, SEP Committee and the Merit Review Commission. Andrew, uh, we're glad you're here, and I had a chance to talk to you before, but let me say officially thank you for being here. Uh, the other thing, uh, and I will say it took quite a bit of cajoling for me to even get her to agree to say this because she's uh, not one for public accolades, but Kathy Jackard uh, will be leaving us. Uh, Kathy, yeah, there she is in the back. Come on up. Kathy's an awesome person. She's uh, uh, returning to the Peace Corps. Uh, and uh, those of you who work with Jackie over the years know, you know, how, what incredible service she's done uh, for the board. And their gain is our loss. And so thank you for eight years of service uh, to NSF. And thank you for humoring me and letting me acknowledge your service. So see her privately and say thank you. I want to offer a couple of congratulations to board members. Uh, Vic was elected to the uh, uh, APLU Council on Research Executive Committee class of 2026 in November. Uh, that's a group that helped shape the research agenda for APLU. So congratulations, Vic. Uh, and Dario uh, was just elected a trustee of uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. So kudos to, uh, to Dario as well. I'm going to run through a bit of uh, things that have happened since the last board meeting. Uh, in October, uh, we held a retreat in Louisville. Uh, it was our first uh, off-site retreat since 2019. It's hard to believe, right? First chance to get together in an off-site uh, since uh, uh, the, the pandemic. And for many of you uh, that are newer, it was the first time to sort of spend an extended time together. And that was really a a terrific set of events. Uh, for those of you who weren't there, just a bit of context. We spent some time at the University of Kentucky uh, looking at one of their projects and how they uh, work with the local economy uh, to address workforce development, STEM education, uh, and business education and processes. And it speaks to the importance of our focus on regional innovation uh, and how the distinct characteristics of regional economies uh, can be supported and sustained by strategic investment. Uh, we also spent some time um, at uh, uh, the University of Louisville uh, and with uh, Somerset Community College and Jefferson Community and Technical College, both of which have benefited from the university's ATE program. Uh, we saw some phenomenal uh, activities around 3D printing and engaging with small companies and uh, educational processes across the state. Uh, it does speak to the way that NSF has a broad reach and touches uh, so many lives across the country. Uh, but we're grateful to all the folks in the state of Kentucky who took some time uh, to both share what they're doing 
uh, and show us uh, some of the things and and share feedback on what uh, is working and its value, but also things that uh, uh, are opportunities for improvement. I have spent a lot of time in DC in the last few months since the board meeting, uh, along with, with some of you. Uh, in September, I met with uh, the majority and the minority House and Senate appropriations staff, and uh, I met with ranking member uh, Rosa Delario, right in the midst of the complicated politics about uh, speaker succession. It was a interesting time, shall we say, uh, to be in DC. Uh, and as I said, uh, spoke with uh, CGAS uh, a majority and majority staff. Uh, also met uh, with um, Research America, uh, Dario and I, uh, and others continued to work on building uh, with AAAS uh, advocacy and support of research funding uh, for the country. Uh, in October, I was back here again and I met with a bunch of Senate and House congressional offices uh, as we talked about how we uh, continue to try to maintain U.S. leadership across science and technology, uh, including issues that span everything from national security to economic development, uh, next generation computing, AI, uh, and a variety of issues around STEM talent development. I won't enumerate all the uh, House and Senate offices, but uh, a fulsome set of meetings. Uh, yesterday, uh, Vic and I met with multiple Senate offices uh, and a couple senators to talk about STEM talent, about AI initiatives, um, and continued investment. As I said, in the future, we have House meetings scheduled for this Friday uh, as well uh, as a follow-up discussion on uh, some additional issues related to that. So in terms of the agenda, um, we've got a lot of topics uh, on our plate. Um, uh, Ponch uh, is going to talk about a variety of updates from the foundation. Um, and after that, uh, after a break, we'll get reports from our committee chairs and our working groups on external engagement, on um, um, indicators uh, in the state of uh, science and engineering in the country, uh, and updates on talent-related works. We'll also get updates from NSF on efforts uh, 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 around increasing safety and, uh, and the issues that uh, we have spent so much time on around the Antarctic Research Program, uh, both in our open and our closed sessions. And I know this is a critical priority that we address the, uh, the situations that have occurred there. Uh, and then we'll have some executive plenary closed follow-up discussion uh, related to, to that as well. And we'll be hearing from a couple of firsthand accounts about their experiences working on the ice. Uh, this afternoon, we'll also uh, uh, include a Committee on Strategy closed meeting in which the director will provide some updates on the 24 and 25 budgets, uh, and we'll have a chance to talk about NSF's implementation of chips and science. Uh, and all of these are uh, documented uh, uh, updates of, of NSF's work on chips and science uh, in the board book. Um, so I trust everyone has taken a look uh, at those. I want to turn to uh, both uh, uh, a sad but also um, uh, important uh, set of comments. We lost uh, one of our dear former colleagues, uh, Carl Leinberger, uh, just a, a little while ago. Uh, and you're seeing some slides on the screen that show some of Carl's remarkable uh, life and history. Um, and we lost Carl on October 17th. He was an incredible uh, intellectual leader in chemistry. Um, and uh, he was a devoted member of the science board. He served from 2010 uh, to 2022, so two full terms. Uh, and I know that uh, most of you, like me, found Carl um, as a mentor and a supporter of so many things. Uh, he was known for his passion on facilities, and that's where I first got to know Carl personally, because I succeeded him as chair of uh, the ANF committee. But he helped strengthen so many aspects of NSF uh, and the NSB's approach to major research infrastructure. Uh, he pioneered what has become the CORF report, the Annual Facilities and Portfolio Review. Uh, he was instrumental in shaping uh, what we now know as the Mid-Scale Research Infrastructure Program. 
And he was successful because Carl was both persistent, but kind and thoughtful. And anyone who worked with him knew that Carl was supportive, engaged, helpful, always friendly, always willing to listen and talk about ideas. Uh, and although he was extraordinarily successful as a scientist, he was a humble giant. And I know that he set a standard to which the rest of us aspire uh, as an intellectual leader, but also as a friend and a colleague and a mentor to many. Uh, and I know, like you, I will miss him. NSF and NSB were the better for Carl's service to the country. He had set a standard that defines excellence, and he did so in a kind and humble way uh, that um, brings credit to him uh, and to the scientific enterprise uh, in this country. Carl, we miss you. And Ponch, I know you, you want to add a few things as well. Thank you, Dan. You said it so beautifully. Um, you know, I joined the board in 2014. And as a young rookie in the board, Carl was a seasoned person who really you look up to. Because when you come to the meeting, you always are watching for people who are making their comments. And you look to those people who make really wise, you know, scientifically strongly underpinned comments that you get inspired by. Carl was, as you said, a giant. And it came from his own personal excellence in terms of what who he was as a scientist and how passionate he was about the science. And it came through very clearly. And Ricky and I and Roger, we were the beneficiaries as the new class members in 2014 that we learned implicitly from Carl, but he was never hesitant to talk to us and uh, to, to us explicitly also. When we reached out to him, he was always ready to share his wisdom, his views, his thoughts. He will never impose on, him, on you at all, ever. But when you reach out to him and when you talk to him, which I have done, I've always gotten excellent advice from Carl. Um, he truly is a, a very wise man, kind man, as you said. And one thing I will always remember Carl by, and the, these pictures are a testimony to that, Carl's smile is infectious. Mm -hmm. He's such a beautiful smile. You just see him, and if you had any problems, you look at Carl and then you smile. <laughs> you know, that's, 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 that's who Carl is. A man who helps, who never hesitates to champion for, uh, serve as a champion for you and your ideas. Uh, I, I mean, he's just an amazing person. And uh, it's too bad that we lost him so soon after his service on the board. He had so much more to give us, even though he was not in the board because he had done his two full terms. And um, we, will, we, will, we will miss him a lot. We'll miss his energy, ideas, thoughtful suggestions. And his contributions are numerous, numerous for the board, for NSF. So now as NSF director, on behalf of all of NSF, Carl, we are most grateful to you. NSF would not be what it is today. And I'm not just you know making this look bigger than it is, truly because of your contributions, because your uh, participation in CPP, then used, it used to be called uh, programs and plans committee. Uh, uh, the, the, the old timers will remember that. Now it's called ANF committee. Uh, Carl was uh, an absolute contributor, and and and, and his work ethic uh, is just is just you know one to I uh, want to treasure. So his contributions and imprint on NSF is truly truly significant, and therefore I'll extend it therefore for what he has done for our nation and the scientific community. So um, Carl will miss you, but your spirit is with us, and what your contributions are will continue. Your legacy will continue. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ponch. I just ask uh, in honor of Carl's memory that we just take a brief moment of silence uh, uh, and recognize all that he has done for the foundation and for the country. All right, thank you. Um, with that, um, that's my opening uh, remarks, and I will hand the floor back uh, to Ponch for his remarks. Thank you very much, Dan. This time, I hope this is going to work, Dan. Okay, that'll be the first, isn't it? <laughs> well, we, 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 we invest in technology <laughs> yeah, we here. We invest in technology, that's right. That's for sure, it does work. So, um, 
good morning to all of you and um, it's uh, it's truly a pleasure to join it's always a delight to see all of you in person and uh, and those joining uh, online like steve uh, good morning to you sir so in the spirit of thanksgiving i always start off with saying that uh, you know my gratitude because your service is um, absolutely vital for nsf to be what it is now and what it will be into the future. So my sincerest gratitude to the board for your continued dedication and all your efforts, which, which makes NSF better. So thank you for your partnership and the hard work of every individual across the agency. You know, thanks you. It has been a tremendous year for science, technology, and innovation across the US. Uh, and you will see that by some of the exemplar things that I shared with you I, by taking this moment as something that we can all reflect upon, the great progress that people make through NSF investments and make us all look good. So uh, I, I want to start off with the Chips and Science Act with a passage of this act. We all know that Congress put in place a roadmap for spurring innovation in all communities throughout the country and positioning the agency to, to capitalize, capitalize on the uniquely American research and innovation ecosystem. ecosystem. I think, I think one, one voice, voice is already, already too loud. loud. <laughs> you don't want twice, twice. <laughs> the yeah. amplification yeah. here. So, um, so, so on, on October 4th, 4th, I had the honor of testifying alongside, alongside the Department of Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo in, in front of the Senate Commerce, Commerce Committee, Committee uh, Commerce, Commerce Science and Transportation Committee, Committee to highlight activities around the implementation and oversight of the Chips and Science Act. The Chips and Science Act provided $200 million for the Chips for America Workforce and Education Fund. And NSF is using the 50 million provided over fiscal years 2023 and 2024 to address the needs of the semiconductor industry. NSF's investments will train upwards of 100,000 new semiconductor professionals over the next five years, fulfilling a key need of the semiconductor industry. We also recognize that building sustained research capacity in all states and territories is critical to our long-term competitiveness. So what are we doing on that front? In September, NSF announced a 9.2 million investment for a collaborative project between Emory University and the National Organization of Research Development Professionals called NORDUP. The, this impactful program will help build capacity at 16 minority serving institutions by providing financial support for research infrastructure, personnel, and services. We all know that the future of US competitiveness requires that we safeguard these critical investments and take necessary steps to address research security. As required by the Chips and Science Act, NSF is in the process of establishing a research security and integrity information sharing and analysis organization we abbreviated that and called it SECURE, to provide needed information and tools to the research community. Full proposals for SECURE were submitted at the end of October, so already it is all in motion. SECURE will enable to, us to establish an innovative entity that will build the capacity of the research community to make risk-informed decisions and create a trusted partnership between research awarding agencies and the research communities. The CHIPS and Science Act specifically directs NSF to support a follow-on study to the 2018 NASM report on sexual harassment in academia. But this is an issue that has been one of my key priorities as a director of the National Science Foundation. Today, we will discuss as a board our agency's actions to combat sexual violence in Antarctica and the scientific community. I want to reaffirm my commitment to ensure the safety, security, and positive environment that will support a vibrant culture of scientific inquiry. We owe our community nothing less, and I welcome the opportunity to work with all of you to achieve these goals. As I always anchor, because I always want to go back and say that we are not doing these things you know, with no continuity, but with the strategy that we all agreed that we will move forward, this agency that is aligned with the 2030 NSB vision. The three strategic priorities 
of strengthening established NSF, inspiring missing millions, accelerating technology innovations are still guiding us as we move through everything that we do at NSF. And I want to show you exemplar activities in all of these three areas, as I always do in my remarks. So the bipartisan support for chips and science has enabled NSF to continue to make tremendous progress in achieving significant milestones in these three priority areas. NSF achievements began with its history of investments in people. I always tell folks, NSF is about people, people, and people. And the rich legacy continues today. And what better way of celebrating that by looking at the 2023 Nobel Prize winners and the 2020 MacArthur Fellowship winners, you know, at the two levels at which I think we can always sort of find tie tracks back to what NSF investments has made possible. So for recognizing and celebrating extraordinary achievements of individuals who are providing society with lasting benefits is one of my favorite parts of not only this day, of this job. So let's look at the 2023 Nobel Prize winners. This is one of the most prestigious and enduring examples of NSF's mission and our impact on the entire range of fundamental research. We have so far funded and supported 262 Nobel laureates, but who's counting? whose work has been supported through NSF's investments. In October, the Nobel Assembly and the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences announced the 2023 Nobel Prize recipients. This year's class, right here, this year's class was once again full of incredibly talented researchers across the agencies, across the sciences rather, who have been supported by NSF at various stages of their careers. This year for physics, the Nobel Assembly recognized Pierre Agostini, Frank Krauss, and Anne Hewler for their independent efforts and combined work, culminating in, the, culminating in the development of an innovative technique that produces snapshots of the electron's motion in real time. NSF is proud to have supported Agostini's experiments through four awards for his experiments in strong field physics and on the atom's response to ultra-fast bursts of electromagnetic radiation. Augustini joins the ranks of 73 Nobel laureates NSF has supported in the field of physics. Next is a Nobel Prize in chemistry. NSF has invested in 67 chemistry Nobel laureates since 1950. This year, we congratulate Mungi Bovendi, Louise Bruce, and Alexei Ekimov for their discovery of quantum dots and a method for reliably producing them. We are proud to have supported the research and early career development of Bruce and Bovindi, both who received NSF's graduate research fellowships. You can see how important the GRFPs even are in terms of setting the trajectory. Bruce also received a research grant to investigate single wall carbon nanotubes and support for NSF's integrative graduate research, education and research traineeship program, IGERT, to train the next generation of scientists and engineers in the field through research experience and mentorship. Bowendi was a career recipient, NSF career recipient, and his work was supported by another 10 NSF grants. Finally, we have the Nobel Prize for Economics, which NSF has supported 68 of the economists, more than 70% of all recipients who have received the Nobel Prize in economics. This year, Claudia Golden, won the prize for tracking American women's labor participation over centuries. With her groundbreaking research, um, uncovering key drivers of why gender gaps remain in the labor market. We take immense pride that NSF has been able to support her through eight research awards. And then to the MacArthur Fellows. The MacArthur Foundation announced its 2023 MacArthur Fellows. These awards, unofficially known as the Genius Grants, are one of the most prestigious awards given across academia, the arts, and the sciences. This year, the 20 MacArthur Fellows will each receive $800,000 of investment in recognition of their contributions to the field of study and in support of their future careers. And NSF is proud to have supported six of those talented and creative individuals. Combined, the six of them, have received over 33 NSF grants across seven different directorates and offices. That includes three career awards and two graduate research fellowships. 
Again, you see the pattern here. Their wide breadth of disciplines, ranging from carbon cycle dynamics to machine learning, is a fantastic reflection of the full breadth of NSF's investments in people and ideas. Civic Innovation Challenge. We all know the best way to tackle some of the world's most significant challenge is through a strong foundation of collaboration and partnership. One NSF program is helping community university partnerships, developing community-driven solutions that forge resilient and equitable futures. The Civic Innovation Challenge is a multi-agency federal government research and action competition supported by $19 million investment through the NSF in, in partnership with, of course, Homeland Security and the Department of Energy. 19 teams of civic leaders and university scholars were selected based on the ready to implement research-based pilot projects that have the potential for scalable, sustainable, and transferable impact on community-driven priorities under one of two tracks. We have two tracks of funding on that. 10 teams under track A are focused on living in climate change, including pre-disaster action based on adaptation, resilience, and mitigation. Nine teams under track B are focused on developing cutting edge resources, programs, and solutions for bridging the gap between essential resources and services and community needs. Just to give examples of these projects, so you get us a little bit more in-depth exposure to that. One track A project, kickstarting a youth-centered green economy for the environmental justice community of East Boston, led by Eastie Farm, will engage local youths in urban farming, coastal restoration, and social science-driven community involvement to create a vibrant green economy with improved resilience to climate change. A track B project, bridging the gap between essential emergency resources and services and the deaf and hard of hearing community in Monroe County, New York, a geospatial, geospatial visual approach led by Rochester Institute of Technology will develop the nation's first deaf community hazard mapping geospatial toolkit to empower deaf and hard of hearing communities to identify, characterize, map, and communicate community hazards with public service agencies. We are excited to see how these pioneering pilot programs will foster community-driven innovation and generate discoveries and solutions that help save lives and enhance resilience across the nation. Now to some of the science awards too. Designing materials to revolutionize and engineer future. So it's called the DMREF awards. In September, NSF announced $72.5 million investment that will drive the design, discovery and development of advanced materials needed to address societal challenges. The Designing Materials to Revolutionize and Engineer Our Future program will support 37 new four-year projects involving 161 researchers at 61 universities across 30 states. One of these teams is led by Northern Illinois University in partnership with the University of Michigan and the University of Illinois at Chicago. The team is working to develop an optimum electrolyte solution for advanced rechargeable batteries. As part of its workforce development program, a research experiences for undergraduate program will be offered where undergraduates will learn skills related to the characterization of materials and machine learning. And then some of the projects that you all had a chance to look at, which is the mid-scale research infrastructure. NSF's mid-scale research infrastructure program is our agency's agile approach for investing in experimental research capabilities and infrastructure. Today, I'm excited to share four new and unique NSF R11 investments, which will support the design and implementation of research infrastructure, including Rochester's laser research facility, Iowa State's wind resiliency project, the University of Washington's ocean science project, and the University of Southern California's cybersecurity project. Let's dive into the cybersecurity project from the University of Southern California, which is an $18 million project. Sphere, which supports a variety of hardware, including computing, machine learning, cyber physical, and programmable network devices, which supports reproducibility and replicability, a long standing challenge in cybersecurity. Then, for those of you who may already know that we did this big showcase in, in the Hill with the 25 AI institutes, 
We all know that how important AI is, and I don't have to belabor that point. It's very well understood. In September, we hosted 25 of these AI institutes on Capitol Hill. Over 100 congressional staff gathered to learn about real-world applications of AI and to see firsthand the many ways in which federal investments are being used in AI research, community partnerships, and workforce development. I'm particularly grateful to Senator Martin Heinrich and Senator Mike Rounds, co-chairs of the Senate AI Caucus, for coming in and engaging with all of the participants. They were very thrilled to see the multifaceted way in which NSF is advancing you know, various societally meaningful and core AI activities through these AI institutes. NSF is one of the largest investors in AI. I've mentioned this several times, and we have done this for several decades. It's not just new. And our AI investments, of course, touches all 50 states of our nation, and with partnerships spanning over 500 funded and collaborative institutions. So this is a fantastic opportunity to do this right in the hill. Talking about AI, on October 31st, President Biden issued a landmark executive order to ensure that America leads the way in seizing the promise and managing the risks of AI. The executive order establishes new standards for AI safety and security, protects Americans' privacy, advances equity and civil rights, stands up for consumers and workers, promotes innovation and competition, advances American leadership around the world, and more. NSF is playing a key role by leading in strengthening privacy preserving and technologies, uh, research in technologies and working to promote leading edge privacy preserving technologies by federal agencies in addition to the workforce and talent development. In fact, immediately after the executive order, we have started doing a number of things at NSF as per the executive order. Right away, soon after that, we on uh, a week later on November 7th, representatives from federal agencies, all federal, many of the federal agencies, academia and the private sector gathered right here at NSF in this room to kick off a collaborative process to design a pilot program for the National Artificial Intelligence Research Resource, or what is called NAIR. NAIR is a concept for a shared national research infrastructure that will connect US researchers to responsible and trustworthy AI resources, as well as the needed computational data software training and educational resources to fuel AI research and discovery. We are excited about the expanded community of innovation that is emerging from NAIR as it builds upon a legacy of successful public-private partnerships that have driven American leadership in research and innovation. Stay tuned. You'll hear a lot of about the progress with NAIR as we are moving into the weeks and months, um, and we're already talking about the next steps. In fact, I've set up a meeting even this morning on that. Um, the president's uh, executive order on AI also talks about this expand AI, which NSF has already put forth and is moving forward with in terms of talent uh, training. We announced a 16.3 million investment for expanding AI innovation through capacity building and partnerships program. Expand AI will advance AI innovation by strengthening and broadening participation in AI research and education at minority serving institutions. The significance of these investments lie not only in advancing research and unleashing talent across our nation, but also making possible transformational opportunities to underserved institutions, ensuring a more inclusive and equitable future of science and technology. And the third piece, is safeguarding AI awards. A 10.9 million investment to the Safe Enabled Learning Systems Program will support research to develop responsible AI technologies. This investment not only strengthens NSF's commitment to fostering the safety of AI systems, but sends a clear message to the research community that NSF considers safety paramount to the responsible expansion and evolution of AI. Just to put this all in perspective, in total, NSF has invested $837 million in AI in fiscal year 2023, with much of those investments going directly to expanding workforce, training, and education opportunities, and to the NSF AI Institutes. This is an increase of $55 million over fiscal year 2022, demonstrating the critical role NSF is playing in the advancement of AI and the role it will play in the investing in the strategy. So this is an example of such. So, so thanks to all of you too. The next topic, this is about the core investments calling the strengthening established in SF, right? That pillar. Now we are on to the next pillar. What are we doing on that front? Some exemplars on that. In the inspiring missing millions. 
So to remain at the vanguard of discovery and innovation, we must continue to strengthen pathways into STEM and expand our reach to all communities where talent exists. So you all know that two new NSF programs, Excellent and Epic, promise to expand our reach into diverse and unique communities across the country. You've all been part of the reports that we have shared with you in terms of the TIP directorate and what it's doing. On Excellent, NSF invested $18.8 .8 million in 27 teams at US institutions of higher education, including teams led by minority serving institutions and historically black colleges and universities. The 18 teams in the excellent beginners track will provide professionals who have some experience in STEM fields with additional learning opportunities to deepen their knowledge and skills in key technologies. The nine teams in the pivots track will provide current professionals in non-STEM fields underscore non-STEM fields with experiential learning opportunities to pursue new careers in fields like advanced manufacturing, AI, and quantum. Each team will receive up to a million dollars over the next three years. For example, North Carolina State University's AI externship project will offer students 40-week externships in data science and AI for diverse, underrepresented students. This project is partnering with Delta Airlines, Lexmark, Randstad, and other org industry organizations for in-class sessions with real-world industry mentoring. On the other award, which is the EPIC Award, which is enabling partnerships to increase innovation capacity, we invested 19.6 million in 50 teams at US institutions of higher education for its first ever EPIC cohort. EPIC is leveling the field for MSIs small academic institutions and two-year institutions by providing the tools, resources, and networks to expand the infrastructure and workforce in current and future innovation ecosystems. Example, Bowie State University Collaborative, known as Leveraging Innovation to Grow High-Tech and University Partnerships, or Light Up, is creating a regional STEM talent pipeline and workforce in the Northeast. Light Up's industry, government, and university partners will support entrepreneurship by focusing on scaling, promising research commercialization to full-scale economic development ventures. This is something our vice chair will be happy to hear. Morgan State University's crest, where he used to be a VPR. Um, and to ensure that US remains in the leader in all areas of discovery and innovation for decades to come, we are working to create a workforce across all disciplines and demographics that is ready to adapt and evolve along with critical and emerging technologies. We invested $5 million in the Crest Center for Advanced Magnets and Semiconductors at Morgan State University, Maryland, the largest HBCU. The center will bring together neighboring institutions to perform bold and innovative studies in advanced magnets and semiconductors. It will also focus on cultivating a pipeline of future professionals in the field of quantum materials and engineering through outreach efforts, education, and workforce development. NSF is working to see that minority serving institutions with a compelling vision for research infrastructure improvement have access to the support and resources they need. Just wanted to make sure these are all not just talk, but these are actually in action. And I hope you're all sort of seeing that uh, in, 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 in a real way. The Arecibo Center. I'm also delighted to share that NSF recently announced a 5 million investment to form a collaborative partnership to establish a new multidisciplinary world-class educational center at the Arecibo Observatory site in Puerto Rico. The partnership includes Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, the University of Puerto Rico, Piedras, Universidad de Sagrado Corazon, and the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I always say this, if I pronounce things bad, you have the right to mispronounce my name. The Arecibo C3 Center will prioritize community engagement particularly for underrepresented groups, through creating new opportunities for STEM education research and skill building, workforce development, and entrepreneurship and community engagement. And then to the topic that you're all been a huge partner and uh, a huge part of the success, early success of the TIP directorate. So thank you. So technology innovation partnerships, the TIP directorate, one of the most important things that the Chips in the Science Act did for NSF was to codify the TIP directorate, unleashing a cascade of programs and initiatives like the original innovation engines. And this engines contractor builder award, engines builder award, um, invest, we invested 9.5 million 
in the engine accelerator to provide custom resources and tailored support for our regional innovation engines. The engine accelerator is a public benefit corporation with origins at MIT, launched to provide infrastructure, programs, and other tailored services to grow and nurture technology startups, as well as existing enterprises looking to scale their operations. Although many of the NSF engines have already created robust regional partnerships and are impacting their local economies with new highway jobs, the engine accelerator will supercharge their efforts. Specifically, the accelerator will connect the engines with one another, create entry points for partnerships, and develop best practices and knowledge sharing to help ensure success and sustainability. Other program, again, meeting the moment with semiconductors and the Chips and Science Act is the FUSE program, the future of semiconductors. I'm excited to share that NSF's investment of $46 million in the future of semiconductors program, FUSE is a powerful new initiative we are spearheading with CHIPS funding. The public-private partnership with Ericsson, IBM, Intel, and Samsung supports 24 research and education projects through 61 awards to 47 institutions, including eight to minority-serving institutions and seven to EPSCoR jurisdictions. An example of that is the University of Washington Collaborative Research Project. And this collaboration is the University of Washington, University of Maryland, and Harvard University to exchange research, mentorship, and training while co-designing electronic and optical computational devices. These new energy efficient materials will be used for storing and processing data for integration into new computational devices. In the process, this collaboration will grow a robust pipeline to educate the next generation workforce in this cross-cutting field, preparing the US semiconductor workforce with hands-on practical experiences. Another program, Pathways to Enable Open Source Ecosystems or the POST Phase Two Awards. POST program harnesses the power of open source development for the creation of new technology solutions to problems of national, societal, and geostrategic importance. We recently announced over $26 million in 19 phase two post projects to cultivate and create new open source ecosystems. Phase two awards provide up to 1.5 million per project over two years to support the transition of promising open source products into secure, sustainable, and impactful networks and systems. The University of California Region Scenic Project is one example of that. The Scenic Initiative, which is led by the University of California system is designed an open source language and toolkit for new AI systems to prevent new system failures that can compromise overall system safety by incorporating a governance framework for developing sustainable frameworks using open source language. New Scenic tools will be designed for verification and deployment in an array of AI systems, including transportation, energy, healthcare, and finance. Scenic activities will be incorporated in educational outreach activities for undergraduate and high school students as well. And this is something that we've been working together, um, which is the Global Centers Program, a new program that we launched on the international front as we are doing all those things domestically too. And the Global Centers Program, I'm proud to say that we share a powerful collaboration here. This program, as you see, supports large-scale collaborative research on use inspired themes in climate and clean energy as the first topic that we launch these centers. Again, on a rapid cycle of working with our partners and making sure that they are pooling their resources and bringing that to the table, real resources. I'm proud to share a powerful collaboration backed by $76.4 million investment in fiscal years 2023, of which NSF's investment is around $30 million. The rest of it is by partners. The Global Centers Program is a testament to NSF's commitment to forging strategic global partnerships. In the first round, joining NSF are like-minded international partners, including Australia's CSIRO, Canada's NSERC and SHIRC, and the UK Research and Innovation UKRI. At its core, Global Centers aims to synchronize uh, and synergize global talent, elevate team science and community-driven research, and translate knowledge into transformative actions through convergence research. U.S. researchers from the seven projects under track one will receive an investment up to five million from NSF with their foreign counterparts receiving their support from their country funding agencies in comparable amounts. So it's an it's a, it's a investment that we make in ours and they make in theirs, but we're synergizing and working together around these major themes and seven of them. 
Let me give you an example of one project again to give a sense of how this is. This is on track one, the Global Center for Clean Energy and Equitable Transportation Solutions is a collaboration between NSF and UK research and innovation called UKRI to foster research networks to decarbonize road transportation, establish a novel education platform for students from K to 12 through university and beyond, and engage communities across nations to co-design, develop, and share equitable solutions for free charging, place-based mobility, and more. This venture involves nearly 20 partners across government, industry, academia, and civic and nonprofit organizations with the potential to expand to at least 11 nations around the world. Beyond pathbreaking research, NSF Global Centers have an equally significant mandate to cultivate the next generation of STEM professionals. We are already on to the next iterate, next, uh, next year's cycle. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have secured global uh, the biotechnology as a team that we're going to be working with uh, other countries who have also um, uh, given their commitment. So it's going to be, again, a large program. So I'm very delighted to see that we are making fast progress in this. Congressional engagements, I always give you a quick overview of this. We are continuing to find opportunities to connect with our partners across the federal government to ensure that we have the resources needed on these ideas, talent, and prosperity across the nation. And thank you, Dan, for all the work that you, Vic, and the team at NSB do. We really appreciate that. Um, so let me give you some quick uh, thumbnails on that. Uh, I did a number of visits with universities, which I always do, because that's where the real action is. At the University of Minnesota, I joined Senator Amy Klobuchar upon her invitation um, and the, at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, where we had the opportunity to participate in a university-hosted science, innovation, and workforce development roundtable, which drew leaders from around the state to discuss opportunities for enhancing equity, diversity, and inclusivity, and growing industries around scientific and technological advancement. Next stop. Um, I went to um, Northeastern. You'll see the Northeastern on the right-hand side corner here. I spoke at the grand opening of the Northeastern University's new state-of-the-art science center, EXP. I was joined by Massachusetts Governor Maura Haley and, and, and the uh, mayor of Boston and many other members of the Mass Massachusetts congressional delegation, including Senator Elizabeth Warren. I had a good chance to talk to Senator. Senator received an NSF award, by the way, in her career. And that was a, a, a conversation that we had. And um, Representatives Jim McGovern, Stephen Lynch, and Ayanna Presley, to celebrate the completion of this amazing new modern center. So these are opportunities. That, and then I was at the University of California, Santa Barbara, a few weeks ago. Again, you know, making sure that the work that is happening in these places, you know, that we go and see them, we engage with the undergraduate students, graduate students, and the community, so that we are always making sure that um, NSF is seen as not only an investor, but a participant and 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 and, 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 and engaged in the, in a full form. Other external engagements, let me go. I'm going to cook, there's a lot of them, but I'm just going to cook through a few of them at least. Uh, it's been a busy year at NSF since our last meeting alone. I've had the opportunity to meet with many stakeholders, organizations, committees, and individuals who want to hear about NSF and partner with us. These conversations are opening doors for high impact work at the nexus of areas like AI, agriculture, energy, climate change, and more. And in August, upon the, um, upon the, uh, uh, suggestion of um, the White House, which asked me to represent um, uh, United States. I traveled to India to represent the US as uh, the head of the delegation at the G20 Chief Science Advisors Roundtable, where STEM leaders from G20 members and guest countries gathered to consider evidence-informed science with respect to opportunities in One Health, synergizing global efforts to expand access to scientific knowledge and creative and inclusive, continuous and action-oriented global science advice mechanism. I also signed a bilateral implementation agreement between NSF and the Department of Biotechnology, which provides a framework to encourage collaborations. And you'll hear a lot more of that outcomes in the very near future. Again, in um, September, I traveled to NYU upon the invitation of um, the NYU, as well as uh, the, um, the White House wanting to be jo joining this, this um, event because of the president of um, Korea, Yoon Suk Yeol, uh, and I were, um, were uh, part of this uh, digital vision forum that they had put together. It was a bilateral research collaboration between NYU and Korea's Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I had a chance to interact with the science minister, and we are having follow-on actions now at a nation-to-nation -nation level, and NSF is a big part of that. Okay. Our CEO is going to go there and, um, and spend some time, too. That's a signing, and that's the... Uh, and then this is a very special moment. 
Last month, we also celebrated the groundbreaking achievements of inspirational individuals by honoring them with the National Medal of Science and Technology, National Medal of Science and National Medal of Technology and Innovation, which was a ceremony held in the White House. A total of 19 individuals who exemplify the spirit of American innovation received medals, including former NSF director Subra Suresh. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Ottawa, Canada, where we signed an MOU between NSF and Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Uh, future activities enabled by the MOU would build on several US-Canada collaborations underway, including the Global Centers Program and the NSF and, and, and CERC uh, and, and SHIRC uh, partnership, and expanding to areas like AI, quantum, et cetera. I'm trying to make sure I'm all done here so that I can Keep you all on time, right? Three more minutes. I will use it. <laughs> Not just kidding. This last year, as you can see, has been a busy and very exciting time for NSF. As we enter the new year, I am truly energized with the opportunity to continue to build on this success at speed and scale. As always, none of this will happen without the great partnership that we have with the board. And I'm very grateful to you. I started with gratitude. In the spirit of thanksgiving, I will finish with gratitude. Thank you very much for all that you do and the critical role that you play to help NSF be uh, a, a successful entity a agency for serving the scientific community and ensuring that we are doing the things that advances the nation's SNT uh, trajectory. So I appreciate, Mr. Chair, the opportunity to share these exciting updates with you, and I look forward for the rest of our meetings together. I'm just going to very quickly announce the. Um, I was told that I should do this also in this board meeting. So this is going to be very quick. OLPA has provided you with talking points under a separate cover. You will have a clicker to advance the slides for me. So I'm going to advance. So here you go. I'm going to keep. So there you go. So I'm going to do some few senior executive introductions very quickly. So the OLPA report, in your board book, you have the OLPA report as we always provide you that. I hope you have all had a chance to see that. And I'm just going to quickly go through the senior executive updates uh, with all of you. Uh, we typically do this division, deputy division director and above. So this is our tradition. So Dr. Wendy Graham began serving her IP assignment as the inaugural division director of the Division of Research, Innovation, Synergies and Education in the Directorate of Geosciences. We have the new RICE program in geosciences. If you remember, Dr. Ison had shared her plans on this new division with you last year, emphasizing innovation. Dr. Graham joins NSF from the University of Florida, Gator, where she serves as a Carl S. Swisher, eminent scholar in water resources and director of the University of Florida Water Institute. Dr. Graham earned a PhD in civil and environmental engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Dr. Ellen Zagura began serving her IP assignment as division director Computer and Network Systems in the Directorate for Computer Information Science and Engineering, SICE. Dr. Zagura received a DSc in Computer Science from Washington University in St. Louis. She joins NSF from Georgia Tech, where she's the Regents and Fleming Professor of Computer Science. Thank you for joining us. A familiar face, Rob Muller, began serving as a CS career appointment as Deputy Office Head of the Office of Legislative and Public Affairs. We are thrilled. Um, in partnership with Amanda Greenwald. He served as a branch chief government affairs, OLPA. Mr. Muller received his JD from George Mason University School of Law. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Mr. Erica Rissi began serving an SES career appointment as chief evaluation officer and section head, evaluation assessment capability officer of integrative activities, OIA. I know many of the members of the committee on oversight have already had a chance to work with Ms. Rissi. Uh, she previously served as Senior Advisor for Strategy and Evaluation in OIA. Uh, Erika Rissi received her Bachelor of Arts in Music from Yale University. Erika, thank you. <laughs> Finally, Dr. Jessica Robin has begun a new role as Deputy Office Head, Office of International Science and Engineering. You see the amount of work that OISC is putting together under the leadership of uh, Dr. Kendra Sharp. She previously served as Section Head in the Division of Earth Sciences. Dr. Robin received her PhD in Geographical Sciences from the University of Maryland. And I just want to take um, a moment, uh, Mr. Chair, um, our um, fearless leader, an amazing leader of the uh, of the Directorate of uh, you know 
uh, Computer Information Science Engineering, Dr. Margaret Martinosi is here. Margaret, if you'll please. Margaret came to NSF a few months before I joined NSF. A, an amazing leader, a leader with tremendous intellect, energy, vision, perseverance, and that number of times she has talked to me about how size budget should grow. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret truly, truly, truly is a champion for the computing community and for NSF. And she's done a stupendous job with, um, and, uh, with White House uh, representing us ably um, in, um, in Congress. And to add to all of that, can you imagine? She went to all 50 states during a tenure to show that NSF is everywhere, engaged with all 50 states. The last few weeks I was watching, Margaret rapidly finishing up the last few. <laughs> so that's truly a commitment, Mr. Chair, of our leaders to ensuring that inclusivity is not just what we talk about, but we practice in many forms, including being there, listening to people, conferring programs. Margaret will be finishing her term next week. Margaret, we will miss you so much. I've said that many times, but you have put together an amazing directorate that's going to do even greater things into the future. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for your service. <laughs> and over to you, Mr. Chair, two minutes late, sorry. That's, that's, I'll, get, I'll cut you some slack. We started six minutes late, so uh, you made up time. So uh, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Pudge, for that uh, fulsome update. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, uh, just a housekeeping element for a minute, uh, which is approval of the open uh, minutes. Um, they're in your diligent board uh, book, uh, tab 3.3. Are there any corrections to the minutes? All right, hearing none, uh, the minutes will stand approved uh, as presented. And I will hand the floor back uh, to Ponch to introduce James Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, um, uh, Dr. James Moore came to us uh, about a year ago, leading our STEM education directorate. As you know, we used to call it the Education and Human Resources Directorate, and we renamed it to STEM Education Directorate. Dr. Moore, hit the ground running right away. He's, of course, his background is amazing. You all know that I introduced him in a prior board meeting when he joined us. A tremendous intellect and a, and, and, and a committed to this, to this work of in STEM education, access, inclusivity, and K to 12 all the way uh, to, to, the, uh, to the upper levels. But you know what I like about James best, even in the one year, he has pretty much spent time crisscrossing all directorates, establishing that strong partnership because he truly exemplifies that vision of what education is not just about what happens in STEM EDU, as important as it is, but it is what he makes possible happen with the fusion of all the directorates, particularly the TIP directorate. Some of the programs that you heard about is because, you know, James worked very closely with Irvin and they do a great job. And so, James, thank you for your leadership and already significant contributions. And now we are going to hear from him about um, you know, the work that he has been doing and the vision and, uh, and where, the, where the future is heading. So thank you so much, James, over to you. Thank you, Punch. Thank you, board, for extending this opportunity for me to present and engage you today. I know many of you all are new to the board, and so uh, we wanna give you a glimpse of the portfolio and the work that we do now and the, where we're going as a directorate. So thank you for this opportunity. Words cannot express that enough. You know, EDU's mission is to develop a well-informed citizenry and a diverse, well-prepared workforce across the STEM ecosystem. And the core of EDU's work is to ensure that talented individuals across the nation can engage and thrive throughout the STEM ecosystem. In EDU, we're helping to make the vision a reality by investing in people, knowledge, and tools to advance excellence in STEM learning in all settings and all contexts. Among these four divisions, which I don't have a lot of time to go in depth, EDU supports educational excellence, workforce development, broadening participation, institutional capacity building in pre-K-12, 
two and four year institutions, graduate education and beyond to prepare tomorrow's STEM workforce. It is, it is also a major investor in STEM education research that advances teaching and learning at every juncture of education. Although a core area of emphasis of the director is educational research, much of the EDU's portfolio is cross-cutting like TIP. In order for us to realize our vision and mission, it's important that we collaborate, as Punch noted, with the traditional directorates. In fact, it's one thing I want to underscore to the group, we're the largest entity in the federal government that funds educational research, particularly STEM education research, um, and which we're very proud of, which is one of the core areas of our portfolio. Current investment priorities of EDU are the following, education learning research, learning and learning environments, both formal and informal, broadening participation and institutional capacity building, scholarships slash fellowships and professional workforce development. As I noted earlier, it cuts across all those four divisions. It is a part of who we are, it's our ethos, uh, these particular areas, you'll see it in every one of our divisions. Through this slide, it is my attempt to underscore the scale and scope of the agency's current investments in STEM education. For example, in FY 2022, NSF invested approximately 1.6 billion in programs that are part of the Federal Committee on STEM Education National Inventory. And by the way, Punch is the co-chair of that specific committee. This inventory includes former programs across the federal government that, for, that support STEM teaching and learning. Of this, EDU's investment is approximately 1.3 billion. Thus, I want to be clear that this does not cover all the NSF investments in students or learning. For example, students covered through NSF scientific grants are not included in this inventory even though their participation in NSF funded activities is a part of the education. But what is on this chart includes all our programs with a direct educational focus. EDU has spent years learning about STEM education and workforce landscape to understand the needs of those who are underserved and under-resourced in STEM. When you look across the agency, uh, when you look at EPSCOR states, uh, EDU uh, funds 48% of the bachelor's and two-year institutions. When you look at HBCUs, we fund about 52% of 52% uh, of the HBCUs. And for tribal colleges, 80%. For Hispanic serving institutions, 60%. We know that much of what we're doing is working. In fact, EDU has been a consistent leader at NSF in broadening participation in STEM education, education research, training, and workforce development. For example, in, in September, we announced grants for two new resource centers for Hispanic serving institutions, an investment of nearly 14 million. These institutions support the enhancement of undergraduate STEM education, recruitment, retention, and graduation, of students pursuing a social or bachelor's degree in STEM. Florida and in, in, in International, and I'm sure Heather will be excited about this, Texas El Paso University are the lead institutions. By the way, a recent report just came out by RITL International, and it noted that Texas El Paso is one of the leaders where individual Hispanic students get their undergraduate education and eventually get a PhD in STEM education. So we're hopeful that these investigators will be able to glean from institutions like Texas El Paso and prime the pump and provide greater support to other Hispanic serving institutions around the country. To fully appreciate the breadth of EDU's portfolio, it's critical that I address some of the grand challenges that the nation faces in education and workforce development across the STEM ecosystem. These grand challenges must be addressed, must be prioritized by the nation in general and NSF in particular. Hispanic, Black, American Indian, Alaska Native students 
accounted for the highest percentage of students who attended high poverty schools in 2021. Providing a high quality STEM education in every zip code is a must. We know that talent exists everywhere, but opportunities don't always prevail. That is why EDU is constantly working to ensure equitable access to STEM education and workforce opportunities. While we have made some progress in diversifying STEM, the data still revealed that STEM majors and occupations are largely comprised of men and with few exceptions. That is where EDU's investments that support the recruitment, preparation, and retention of students in STEM are playing a major role, as well as our investments in the proliferation of STEM teachers in some of the most distressed, under-resourced school systems in America. For example, through our NOAA's program, we have impacted over 16,000 teachers and over nearly 5,000 school districts around the country. NOAA certified STEM teachers are in nearly 30% of the nation's school districts. And by the way, there are a little over 16,000 school districts around the country. We know that student math and science scores are not where they need to be to compete on the global stage. For example, look at the recent NAEP scores. The average mathematics scores for the nation were lower by five points at fourth grade and lower by eight points in the eighth grade compared to scores in 2019. EDU invests in educational research. As I noted, we're the largest entity in the federal government that funds STEM education research. To learn how students learn best and what teaching modalities are most effective and it is laser focused on disseminating best practices to schools nationwide. Sadly, we know that there is a dearth of teachers nationwide and the dwindling numbers of students earning degrees in STEM education have profound impact on our national competitiveness in STEM. And EDU supports, um, Bill supports efforts to build capacity improvements to research and academic support at minority serving institutions. In collaboration with all our colleagues across the agency, as well as in the philanthropic community, industry, and other federal agencies, EDU is active in its quest to address many of these challenges. We realize that our budget is large, but certainly not large enough. So collaboration is a must for us to leverage and maximize all of our human and financial resources to ensure that we can democratize STEM across the nation. EDU funds a wide range of programs that work to expand equity in STEM. In fact, we have an entire division devoted to this called the Division of Equity for Excellence in STEM that we affectionately like to refer to as EES. From our programs, that aim to expand access to students at HBCUs, tribal colleges and universities, and other minority serving institutions, to projects that dive deep into the role access plays in the STEM workplace for people with disabilities. EDU has funded numerous important interventions. For example, we funded the project called Includes Planning Grant, cultivating research and equity in sign related technology. Historically deaf individuals and sign language users have been underrepresented in technology development. But when fund, with funding from EDU, Gaudet at university researchers have, been significant, have made a significant impact in the field of sign language technology. They have formed a new community in which researchers, students, scholars, and technicians can all come together for the equitable advancement of technology. And they have provided a platform for collaboration and knowledge sharing. The events hosted by the researchers have increased the visibility and the representation of deaf individuals in the field and have contributed to the knowledge generation and pedagogical methods that have potentially 
to improve the quality of life for individuals with deaf, who are deaf. And earlier this year, EDU, in collaboration with our colleagues in SIS, partnered with the U.S. Department of Education to establish a new AI institute to focus on speech and language pathology needs of children. If this project realizes what these investigators propose, it will be groundbreaking. It will be transformative. What they propose, if you don't know this, there is a dearth of speech and uh, speech and hearing professionals across the United States, especially in some of our most underserved, under-resourced school districts. If you're fortunate to have a speech and hearing profession, uh, oftentimes these individuals who work in these settings don't have the time to fully work with the students. There are many things that is outlined in this project, but I usually can only minute, remember three of the five because three of those three are the most important to me. Uh, so I apologize in advance. One, uh, it is the use of AI to, uh, for diagnostics, for assessments. Two, once you're able to uh, diagnose is to use AI for intervention. And three is to use chat GPT for, for the note taking. If you know anything about individual educational plans, they take a lot of your time and in these schools. So this could be very transformative and we think it could be a blueprint for other uh, grand challenges that we see in K-12 education. Supporting excellence in U.S., and this is a topic that is dear to me, but certainly aligned with the board's priorities when you, last year, you outlined uh, some of the debt that certain individuals uh, accrue. Supporting excellence in U.S. STEM and workforce development means preparing the next generation of STEM professionals and retaining a diverse cohort to consider STEM careers. We know a STEM degree in some institutions costs more than a non-STEM degree. And we certainly don't want students who might not have the means, financial means, to foreclose on pursuing a STEM degree because they can't afford it. This is probably one of my highest points is to be able to send that memo to Punch to see if we can increase um, the support for our STEM um, scholars. Uh, we hadn't increased it in five years. And we increased it from an uh, undergraduate degree from $10,000 to $15,000. And for a graduate degree from $20,000 to $25,000. By the way, I, di I didn't make everyone happy. And some people probably still mad at me, said I should have asked for more. Um, but nevertheless, we didn't want our footprint to decline across the nation. This mission is critical, important, as students are considered low income, more likely to leave higher education after their first year than their peers. This likelihood increases at the intersection of students who are both low income and first generation or from under source communities like in the Delta region of Arkansas or in, in Mississippi or in Appalachia, the Blue Ridge Mountains of, of Tennessee uh, or Gary, Indiana or Washington, DC. I think you get the gist. This ensures us that students who have talent that financial means will not be the deterrence for them to be able to engage in the STEM um, ecosystem. Support and recruitment. EDU is a major player in the agency across the federal government investing in the success of graduate students. And I won't repeat some of this because um, Punch has already highlighted it. Uh, this is the Darling. This is one of the oldest programs in the agency. Uh, and not only that, with we reimagine our approach. Uh, things that I learned at Virginia Tech on um, Beverly Warford is that you don't just give people a scholarship, you gotta engage them and to ensure that they're aware of all the different opportunities that are available to them. Even though these students are immensely bright, but we want to ensure that, that they're gonna be successful and that they don't foreclose on the pursuit of this degree because it may not be a good fit. So, we convened all our, our uh, recipients virtually 
and trying to, in many ways, in our own way, to create a community of practice where they can engage and where information can be shared among these individuals. The Chips and Science Act, huh, a game changer, it's like what we like to say in EDU, it's our spudding moment of our time. It gave us the ability to increase the number of fellows. Um, and But of course, we get more applications than we can fund. So hopefully, uh, we'll figure out a, a path forward uh, where we can fund not only the the worthy recipients, but even the ones who reach the honorable mention status. You know, shifting gears a bit, who here struggled with calculus? You don't have to raise your hand because we don't want people to know, but, but it's okay because you're brilliant and you reached this point in your life, or at least know someone who struggled in calculus. Well, in EDU, we invest in education research that takes aim at some of the roadblocks that often prevent people from pursuing further education, even in careers. In this case, researchers at Florida International University found that active learning leads to greater student success in undergraduate calculus courses compared to traditional lecture-based learning. This project was funded by one of EDU's first awards through our IU's Hispanic Serving Institutions program. Improving teaching methods in calculus means students are more likely to stay on track and stick with STEM with a STEM program. That in turn has helped ensure the graduation of more STEM professions. This is the type of research that is a game changer, not just for students at FIU, but at colleges, other colleges and universities around the country. EDU is known for keeping its ear close to the ground and being connected with the community. And we heard you, um, board members. I had the opportunity to talk to Judith and many of the education team here. And hearing what the teacher said is about NSF has made immense investments in educational research and the development of curricula, but there are entities across the country that did not have access to that. In many ways, uh, there was a recent report that was targeting IES through the U.S. Department of Education, but we just kind of blanked out IES and put EDU in there, and it said that we need to be more engaged. Our work needs to be, using the term in the recent report that you all produced, needs to be serviceable, right, the research. As we think about sharing that know-how from one teacher to another, from one school to another, EDU realizes that we need to figure out better ways to disseminate evidence-based best practices to reach those who need it most. We started in one division, but we hope to see this as a common thread throughout our directorate. So as a part of our Discover Research Pre-K-12 program, we sent out a call for submissions to our new Dear colleague letter, supporting knowledge mobilization for pre-K and informal STEM learning. So we can get from the community, what are the best ways that we can disseminate to ensure that the people who can benefit the most from these investments? Uh, stay tuned for more uh, projects are being developed. Building capacity, as you know, is one of the themes in our director. It was certainly a theme across the agency particularly under the leadership of PUNCH, uh, particularly in the Office of Integrated Activities through our granted program. But EDU also supports efforts to build capacity at academic institutions. As I noted, many of the institutions that I noted that we make immense investments, we know we need to cultivate relationships with them. We know that they don't always have the same kinds of infrastructures like institutions like my home inst institution but we recognize that there are immense uh, capabilities and talents at those institutions. NSF Research Traineeship Program is one of the agency's most competitive programs, and NRT addresses workforce development, emphasizing um, broad, uh, broad, broadening participation in institutional capacity building needs in graduate, educa graduate education. Last year, EDU awarded 22 new awards that address a variety of emerging technology areas, including AI, 
quantum material science, environmental sustainability, and data science, and much more. Stay tuned. We're going to do a, even more in those areas, particularly at institutions that we like to reference as emerging and developing institutions, uh, thanks to collaborations with our colleagues across um, the agency. Community colleges is an area of significance and importance um, that we need to make even greater investment and pay even more attention, attention to. And through our IUs program, EDU welcome a new intervention to the mix this year with the innovation in two-year college STEM research program. There's a disproportionate number of students at the community college, and oftentimes they came from some of the most vulnerable, under-resourced school systems in the country. Oftentimes, when you look at graduation rates, it's not faring well. And so we decided we needed to focus on student success in this particular two-year area. The agency will accelerate the impact inclusive and evidence-based practices in the undergraduate education in this area. EDU is also partnering with OIA on Granted. We understand that not all schools have those same infrastructures, as I said. Granted is a whole of a NSF approach that will help transform the science and engineering community specifically and non-R1 institutions. Uh, speaking of partnerships, I would be remiss if I did not take a minute to emphasize the importance of partnerships. EDU is a cross-cutting directorate and at the agency, we're integrated vertically and horizontally, and we work with our colleagues across the agency to collaborate on a variety of important projects. There, these are just a few examples. With TIP on workforce development through Excellent, and also with TIP and industry partners to advance the nation's semiconductor workforce. With GEO to support educators, both formal or informal, to travel to the Antarctica or the Arctic to work collaboratively with researchers, with engineering to provide undergraduate students with hands-on research opportunities in STEM priority areas related to semiconductors, and with MPS to expand access to hands-on training and broadening participation in cutting-edge lab work. Of course, we collaborate with the others as well, so I don't want them to send me a mean email. Uh, because we do recognize that we collaborate. We're a cross-cutting directorate. Right now, EDU's investments directly impact thousands of students and teachers. While this is a number that has grown steadily, I recognize that it's still a small portion of those in the STEM pathways. You can see by these numbers, which show a general estimate of our reach, there's more we need to do and there's more we will do. Our goal is to reach more individuals, orders of magnitude larger than we currently serve. In order for us to do this, we have to leverage our human financial resources, as well as collaborate with philanthropy, industry, and other entities across the government. With our investments in EDU, we will continue to make these strides in tackling the grand challenges. I promise you, I know we can do more. I know we can be even more impactful. Many of the individuals in this agency, and, and particularly in EDU, we see our work as noble. We see it as a quest to help the nation become or sustain its place as a leader in innovation. I look forward for the opportunity to take your questions on what you heard today, as well as uh, any other things that you didn't hear. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, James. Um, we'll, uh, I'm looking at uh, hands up online. Um, so I see Matt, Marvy, Julia, um, and Deborah. So we'll just go in that order. So we'll start with Matt. I, uh, Dr. Moore, you've already covered, uh, touched on this, and I know you know how important it is, but I just want to emphasize the 
measurements of the inputs that you all are doing are ex extremely impressive. You know, the numbers of students and teachers involved, the numbers of states, things like that. But of course, what's really important and it's harder to do is to measure the outcomes from all of these programs. And it could be a lot of different things. It could be, for example, students learning calculus better, uh, maybe more likely to earn STEM uh, degrees, undergraduate, even advanced degrees, or get employment in STEM. There's a lot of different uh, goals you could have. Of course, that kind of requires more difficult longitudinal studies mm -hmm. to, to, to get a handle on that. But I just want to encourage you all yeah, to, to yes. pursue that. We, we got to see what's really working the best. Yes, sir. Here, what to push hardest on. No, no, I, I appreciate that. And I can tell you we're working on that uh, with a lot of vigor. And stay tuned for more. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Moore, for, for your presentation. And uh, my question is actually in regards to how the directorate is engaging with departments of education of each of the states and territories. Um, to implement and scale up learnings from the research in education, right? What would you say is the strategy for that interaction with all the states and territories? Oh, great question. And and so let me just say, um, the uh, IES is the second largest entity that funds in educational research, and Mark is is the lead, and so we collaborate on a number of different projects. In fact, that AI Institute that I noted. Uh, they were one of the collaborators. We're working on something else that is ready to come out. We meet on a monthly basis on thinking about, because we recognize if you took EDU out and you took out IES, we really wouldn't have an entity in the federal government that funds educational research in an abundance, right? Um, and so we recognize we're stronger when we collaborate together. In fact, um, Two weeks ago, we convened the largest educational philanthropic organizations, and the topics were what we were focusing on uh, is assessments, uh, measures, as well as large assessments uh, systems, what are most appropriate. So as I noted before, I recognize I do we do have a big budget, and I don't want to um, uh, uh, dismiss that, but I recognize when I think about the grand challenges of things, it's important that we leverage our human and financial resources and to connect philanthropy, industry, and those efforts. When you talk about the different regions and those particular areas, as you know, harnessing the geography of innovation is a big part of the agency. And TIP is sort of like that North Star, and we collaborate closely with TIP in, the, in that area. Uh, as I noted in one of my earlier slides, I, we like to think it's a part of our ethos in EDU, uh, particularly when we think about minority serving institutions, because we make tremendous investments in those areas, and we know that they will play a critical role in that. When you look at the EPS score states, I didn't say this, but there's a correlation with EPS score states, with the diversity of our nation, as well as the highest poverty uh, in our country in those states. And so we're trying to be aggressive in our outreach efforts and collaborating with the Office of Integrated Activities and really going out to those states so they can be fully aware of those activities. In closing, I'll say this. My mom worked in social services for 30 some years and something she used to tell me. She said, you can't help the people if you don't spend time with them. And so we're trying to spend time with people who we haven't cultivated those meaningful relationships with. I don't know if I came close. I was actually trying to address the specific relationship um, of NSF with departments of education across different states. So I oh, understand the oh, strategy the across level. you know state all level. of the other players, but I'm you know trying to you know get that collaboration going. If there's a strategy on scaling up and implementing the learnings from the research, right? Yeah. And, and they, the impact, I'm trying to think about, okay, so you, you invest in research in education. How do you then learn from it and implement those learnings? Um, and if there's a strategy in the engagement with the departments of education. We, we hadn't really engaged at the state level because it's, it's the wild, wild west in comparison. I, I don't mean 
just say that, but it varies from state to state in their priorities. However, if you remember when I talked about that DCL, about knowledge mobilization, uh, that is one mechanism that we're using to determine what are the best approaches to disseminate uh, exemplary practices. All right, looking at the list, again, I'll just reiterate the order. Uh, Julia, Deborah, Vic, Suresh Babu, Roger Beachy, and Suresh Caramella. Deborah. No, I'm next. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, good morning, James. Good morning. Um, we have sep I've um, separately um, enjoyed our interactions, and um, in particular, uh, as you know, the board is very engaged in talent de development mm -hmm. writ large. And one of the areas that we've kind of arrived at as being sort of a nexus for a lot of the issues we are trying to address is community colleges. Mm -hmm. And I know you have a lot of passion about that mm -hmm. as well. Um, could you say a little bit about what uh, you are um, planning within EDU in the community college regime? Yeah, I'm, I'm, we spent a lot of time engaging. Thanks Celeste Carter, she's certainly a pioneer in that space. Um, but, but thinking about community colleges much broader than how we've been leveraging them. And, and all, whether you're in a rural context or urban context, there's usually a community college in close proximity. One of our grand challenges that I didn't really spend a lot of time, but I kind of uh, highlighted is um, access to quality teachers, curriculum, and opportunities. Uh, particularly, I know being in Ohio and Appalachia, those are regions, the kids take everything that they can take but it sometimes may not be enough. Um, and that's true what I'm hearing in the Black Belt of Alabama or whether we're talking about Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, so in other words, some students don't even have access to uh, a calculus uh, class or algebra class. Um, I always say this as an antidote. I was in South Carolina doing outreach and one of the legislators said, in my county, there's 900 kids and I only have one math teacher in the whole county. And the highest math you can take is algebra. To me, that's malpractice. That, that has nothing to do with the intelligence of a kid. It's just really about the access to opportunities. But in most community colleges, you can take a calculus class. You can take a physics class. You can take, that's probably the closest. It's a reservoir. And so we need to think about how do we leverage? Because we're not going to proliferate enough teachers overnight. And if we don't do something now, we have to, we may lose a generation. So it's a both and approach and how we can utilize community colleges in that way. And really what spurred that kind of thinking with me, I, I can't think of his name, I apologize right now, but the, the Dean of Engineering of uh, Maryland, a University of Maryland College Poor, he's from South Carolina like I am. And he told me he took all his classes, his STEM class um, at, um, um, at the University of South Carolina at Sumter. And just think, he's a dean of engineering. If he didn't have that opportunity, we may he may not be the dean of engineering. So uh, I think NSF can play a role. We can't do it all by ourselves. And one of the things that Punch is pushing us, and I'm excited about this push, because I'm, is that we need to collaborate. We need to cross borders. We need to leave our office. We need to go places so we can leverage our resources and pool them in meaningful ways. Deborah. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Moore. It was really refreshing to have this be a major agenda for us. And as Julia just said, we have a lot of interest in this across the whole board. And you know this for me in particular, mm -hmm. very much in central interest. I was, um, I thought I was well informed about um, the STEM directorate, but I wasn't aware of what a small investment, relatively speaking, um, the directorate's currently making in K-12 education. And one of the things we keep coming back to um, is that these problems begin well before community college or higher ed. And we've been talking quite a lot about that. And I guess several issues that relate to that include not only studies of young children's learning, but also a serious problem with the teacher workforce and what it would look like to not only recruit teachers of color and talented teachers, but actually provide the kind of preparation that's needed. That's the second issue. A third one that we've talked about is the intersection between the data on disproportionate patterns of punishment of black children and children of minoritized populations that push them out 
and a final one has to do with um, longitudinal studies. So I'm just wondering a bit about how decisions get made about the relative percentage of investment in children and youth before they even get to the places that we're so concerned about and having to do with the well-informed citizenry and the development of a workforce. These issues, we can't improve those without those investments. And I'm also pleasantly struck with your statement that um, NSF provides the greatest proportion of federal funding for education research. That, to me, makes more urgent what my question is asking you, because there are not other sources to study the problems I'm just describing um, in STEM alone, let alone in other areas which also intersect the STEM issues, like literacy, for example. I'm just curious like how, how the priority decisions get made, who influences them, and how are you thinking about that, given the larger set of problems? I know you think about these things. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me just say this. I'm going to try to give you the succinct version so we can talk after lunch. But but I'll just say this. When you look at our budget, it is a large budget. And so when I came in, I, you know, I, I had big eyes and just thought we could do a lot of different things. But I'm not saying we can't, but you got to understand the budget model here, just like any other place. And so many of the programs within EDU are um, congressionally mandated programs. And so when you look at educational research, which is, I like to think is our core. Don't, it's about 200 million, don't quote me, somewhere around in that, that we have. And if we have cuts, I have to cut the core, right? So based on the priorities, and so it's a challenge. So that's why when I understood it, when I thought to our budget person, I said, now it's even more a sense of emergency for me to collaborate with. That's why I'm connecting with the philanthropic community. That's why I'm connecting with industry. That's why I'm connected with TIP, uh, where we can have the synergistic opportunities where we can have impact. It forces us to lose, lose, leave our silos in a way to have those kind of impact. All the things that you're talking about, they're very important, but it's also important that we have a clear understanding of what those grand challenges are, not just to fund research for research, but research in those communities like in Detroit, like those communities like in Youngstown, Ohio, or Washington, D.C., or in some of these rural areas. So we really need, and then when I go out and do the outreach, you know, I'm, I'm pleading with the community in a way to say well, that it's not just uh, that these young people don't have the capability or the intellect is some of these other kind of factors. If in urban areas, you know, you say why kids may have gaps. Well, the mobility rate is high and it's not because they're looking for better schools. It's because they're looking for housing. So it's important that we connect with these other federal agencies in a way to kind of address more than the things that we think that take place in the classroom. So, so, so we're still working on it. This is Thank you. I mean, it does seem like this is an area where Congress and others might need some education about what we understand about what does create change. And you're right about communities. But when we ignore the classroom repeatedly, we actually get the same results over and over. So I think yeah. it's a both and. Yeah. So I hope there's an opportunity to help others who make these decisions and these balances like to consider what the consequences can be. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, just a reminder, we're coming up on our break. I okay. want to make sure everybody gets the word in, So, but please try to be brief because there's a jam-packed <laughs> agenda. Vic. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Moore, thank you for an excellent presentation. Thank you what you do for the foundation, for the country. I want to bring something to your attention <clears throat> on your radar screen, and we can talk offline. But about 12 years ago, uh, 10 of the um, minority technical organizations, Nobuche, Sockness, uh, ship got together. Uh, and to your point, um, when you talk about there is talent everywhere, but access is not, there also needs to be role models that are there. They work with K through 12 undergraduate and graduate ecosystems. Uh, fast forward October 25th at the Sockness Conference, about 25 of those organizations got together. They had signed an MOU a decade ago, kind of, and it's under a coalition called Changes, Changes, and it's and don't ask me what the acronym is, but it, I can send you the slides. What's very important is, as we try to get the missing millions, it's important to have these professional societies from black chemists, 
black engineers, uh, Hispanic engineers, organizations like SOCNIS, Great Minds in STEM, and Bayer to be part of this because mm -hmm. they provide that glue that helps keep your programs together. Because if a young woman or young man, whatever they look like, wants to pursue STEM, they want to see the James Moores, they want to see the Doradas, you know, they want to see a lot of different people, the Bevs, those people out there. And so these professional organizations are very important. One problem they've always had is now that they as a coalition in building is getting funding through, through the Science Foundation because usually they don't have sponsored program offices and they usually got to be affiliated. So I just bring that to your attention because those folks, if it wasn't for Nobuchet, I would not be sitting here right now talking to you, okay, as a graduate student who was in chemistry. And those organizations play a key role in the retention as well as the attraction of students in STEM. Do I have time to say one thing? Oh, okay. Um, let me just say, I totally agree, plus one, what you said. And when I was a program officer, I followed um, Beverly Wofford. Um, and it's something that I've been thinking that could be scaled. And what we do, we funded, I think, seven of the top affinity organizations. And not only that, we gave them travel grants for those students to go to those conferences, to be mentored. And I think there's a place for that, um, for us to do things like that and to ensure that students have access to these professional opportunities to and mentors like what you described. All right, Suresh Babu and then Roger and we'll need to wrap it up. Dr. Moore, thank you very much. So one of the things you pointed out is a collaboration with the state level, even though, do you have any best practices which is emerging because of the TIP uh, phase one awards? Is there a best way to collaborate with state level K to 12 education? Some best practices we can adopt? Uh, not at this point. Um, however, Erwin and I have an ongoing conversations with many stakeholders to think about how do we leverage potentially um, the level track two um, regional engines, because we know education needs to be a part of that if we want to harness the geography and innovation in those areas. Um, so we're stay tuned for more. I just don't have a, all the insights right now, but I can guarantee you this, uh, we're running the marathon at a sprinter's pace. Roger. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Moore, for your presentation. It's excellent. Yes, Learned a lot. Uh, my, actually, a lot of the innuendos that came from other questions that affect my answer. But, but I'm curious, not just about that linkage between TIP and the 487 or whatever uh, applications for type 1. They've done a cross matrix of, of where they come from and whether or not those community colleges and high schools have been engaged uh, are, are, are already engaged in that region, or does a type one um, application imply that they will come to the agency for additional educational support? Uh, because what you pointed out was very really interesting that 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 there's a, they're missing. There are a lot of schools that miss capabilities and opportunities as a consequence. And I'm wondering, has there been a leveraging, or can there be a leveraging? between these these groups that come together as a type one and and how you find those missing groups. You pointed out Youngstown or Detroit yeah. or somebody. I, I wonder if there's a correlation and whether it can do a matrix. At this point, we, we I haven't had the, those kind of in-depth conversations with the TIP directorate. I have some insights because when I see the map, I come in with a lot of questions and I ask Erwin and he has to kick me out of his office. Um, uh, keep the, keep asking. <laughs> uh, but 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 nevertheless, let, I, I can say this. One of the reasons why I was interested in this role is because of TIP, because I thought TIP was could be um, the impetus to transform education. Uh, and and what I mean by that is because um, through our collaborations with TIP, I found. In my early life, too, I had this role. I didn't think industry really cared about K-12 in the same way that, you know, what I would hear them say. But I can say since I've been in this role, they made some of our big industries have
have made tremendous investments in education in collaboration with TIB. So I'm very hopeful. Um, and some of the things that Deborah outlined, I think, is these kind of entities that amplify the importance of education. And let me just say this. Um, I appreciate your enthusiasm and your commitment to this space uh, because I think it's amplified it throughout this agency, uh, the importance of K-12 in ways in my first time being here, I don't think it was amplified in the same way. So I thank you all for your service in this space. All right, well, thank you, James. We appreciate your commitment as well. Um, we're going to take a 10 minute break uh, and we'll reconvene at the top of the hour at noon Eastern. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, as I said, we, we have a, a fairly packed agenda, and although I want fulsome conversation, please try to resist the falling into the academic trap of more of a comment than a question, uh, which we've often seen our academic colleagues engage in. So um, I just want to um, uh, just quickly uh, say thanks to the uh, Explorations in STEM K-12 Education Group, otherwise known as ESCI. Uh, we, uh, as we just talked about, the importance of quality pre-K STEM education, it's the pipeline uh, to success for uh, the STEM uh, adult population in the workforce. And as we know, uh, the challenges there, they endanger our economic prosperity, they, welcome, they uh, weaken U.S. innovation, uh, and they also relate to our national security, but perhaps most important of all, it's a fairness and equity issue. Uh, and we know this is a longstanding issue, and we spent a lot of time highlighting it and talking about uh, proposed solutions. Whatever progress we made, it was damaged by the pandemic. Uh, we know that. Um, we've seen standardized scores at 30-year lows, uh, and it has disproportionately affected uh, first-generation students and uh, and students of color uh, and students of lower socioeconomic circumstances. So I'm grateful to ESKI for all the work they've done. Uh, ESKI was led by my Matt Malkin with support from Suresh Babu, uh, Deb Ball, Mel Huff, Julia Phillips, Scott Stanley, Wanda Ward, uh, Beverly Watford, uh, and Steve Willard. We've got to keep pushing on this issue. Uh, and although ESKI's work is concluded in the final reports in tab 5.2 of Diligent, uh, it'll be made public after this board meeting. It includes a set of actions for future board work, uh, including increasing and strengthening the instructional workforce uh, research, as we just talked about, uh, into best practices, uh, equity, uh, and accountability. 
Uh, and this was a lengthy process, as, as we know from many of the discussions. I also want to thank lots of the pre-K-12 uh, uh, school ecosystem that uh, engaged with the board in these conversations. Um, the recommendations in the final report uh, really call on us as NSF to amplify work in this space uh, and for NSF to continue building coalitions to amplify solutions. And they also align with Vision 2030 uh, and with the Chips and Science Act. And uh, they'll be picked up uh, by our talent development team that's led by Julia. Uh, and we'll hear more about that work later today. But let me say a big thank you. Uh, to Matt uh, and the whole ASCII team for all the hard work uh, to produce the report. So thank you. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn the floor uh, to Dario uh, for a report from the Committee on External Engagement. Dario. Just in time here. <laughs> Um, so let me first uh, uh, provide us a reminder that the members of the external engagement committee are Suresh Babu, Deborah Ball, Dorota, Steve Lee, Alan Stern, Beverly, uh, Steve Willard, and Heather. And uh, last month, uh, we held a retreat to continue exploring ideas for the board's engagement strategy that is um, centered on the urgent need for STEM talent, especially, especially in critical technology areas. And as we've previously discussed, data from the board science and engineering indicators are key to illustrating the problem that we face. That is that we must invest in domestic STEM talent to meet our workforce needs in critical areas, and that we're very dependent on international STEM talent for which we have no backup plan if some of that international talent stops coming here to study, stay, and help you, the, the US meet its workforce needs. So we're moving forward in multiple ways. Uh, one, we're continuing to meet with Congress and the White House and are engaging with leaders in the science and technology community about the STEM talent crisis. Second, that we're refining the problem statement and tactics that to co-develop with partners, attract champions and advance solutions to meet this national challenge. So as I mentioned earlier, the work with NSV Science and Engineering Policy Committee, led by Maureen and, uh, and Shures Babu, is foundational to the board's STEM talent emergency strategy, and we've relied heavily on indicators to develop uh, the one-pagers that we've used with our meetings with Congress, the White House, and others to lay out the STEM talent problem. As we'll hear in a moment, uh, SCP committee members led by Maureen and Suresh and Marvi and Julia are planning to produce several policy briefs and one-pagers over the coming months that will provide additional key data and momentum to the board STEM talent crisis strategy. So before turning things over to Maureen, um, I also want to share that Marvi, Alan, Kaven met recently to brainstorm about how influencers ranging from community leaders to celebrities uh, could help with NSV and NSF engagement initiatives. And I'm sure that we will be hearing more about their ideas in the coming months. So Maureen. Yes. Oh, Thank you, Dario. Um, before reporting on the committee's activities, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Stephen Deeds, our new science analyst at NCSES, who has joined the SCP staff team as executive secretary uh, as Carol Robbins' term in this capacity expires. I'd also like to thank Carol, a senior economist and analyst with NCSES, for her two terms of service as executive secretary. Her expertise, particularly in innovation has been of great value to the committee and to indicators overall, as well as to the country, I would say, who rely on indicators for, for uh, the perspectives it offers. So now to the committee business. As Dario mentioned, uh, the SEP committee has been diving into data, analysis and policy priorities related to the need to address STEM talent crisis in this country. Uh, two major um, SEP threads have been, first, that uh, indicators, of course, both developing and releasing reports for the 2024 cycle and working to improve indicators' relevance and utility in the 2026 cycle and beyond. So this effort is broader than just a STEM talent, but uh, talent is, of course, a major focus. Uh, in addition, there have been two uh, subcommittees or uh, policy teams within SAP, 
a national security team, which is currently looking at U.S. reliance on foreign-born STEM talent, and a talent development team, which is focusing more so on the development of domestic talent. Uh, you'll hear updates on this work from Mari and Julia, the respective heads of those subcommittees, uh, in just a minute. On indicators, the board has published three of the thematic reports for the 2024 indicators cycle, academic R&D, elementary and secondary STEM education, and higher education in s and &E. Uh, for the two reports with a focus on STEM talent, uh, if I could have the slides, please. I just wanted to give you a little bit of data. Uh, so this slide is from the elementary and secondary STEM education report. Uh, this report figure shows the math score declines from 2020 to 2022 uh, for nine-year-old students by race, ethnicity, and percentile, uh, the green bars, which are uh, the percentile scoring on the test themselves. So mathematics scores significantly declined for both fourth and eighth graders in 2022, following the COVID-19 pandemic's unprecedented disruptions of K through 12 education. National math and science assessments help us to understand the pandemic's long-term impacts on future STEM talent and economic growth. And it's our hope that decision makers can use this report and, and the rather alarming data it has revealed to inform a response both at the state and federal level. Um, any actions must um, help support our teachers who have such a huge impact on learning. Uh, one, one element of this uh, data I would like you to focus on are the green bars. So um, this is to me one of the more disturbing um, aspects of, of, this, of these findings and of this data, that there's been an increase in the gap between the lowest performing and the highest performing achievers. So this is data divided by the percentile ranking on the scores on the tests themselves. And although everyone declined over this period, all the bars are in the negative zone, you can see that students in the lowest percentile, the 10th percentile of mathematics understanding and achievement have experienced a far greater drop in scores than students in the higher percentiles. So we've increased the gap, and I think this is this is of you know a particularly alarming significance. If I can see the next slide, please. So this is data from the Higher Education in Science and Engineering report, and this report figure shows uh, race and ethnicity of SNE degree award recipients by degree level in 2022, compared to the U.S. population overall, which is shown in the top um, bar. Uh, of individuals who are in the ages in which degrees are typically awarded between 20 and 34. So the number of science and engineering certificates and degrees earned by students from most racial and ethnic groups has grown, which is a positive trend that's not shown on this, on this slide. Um, and it has also encouragingly grown across most degree levels over the last decade. However, as of 2021, American Indian and or Alaskan Native students, Black or African American students, and Hispanic students were underrepresented among science and engineering certificates and degree award recipients at most award levels uh, relative to their proportions in the U.S. population. So if you just compare the different colored bars in the first horizontal line to those same colors in the lines below, you can just in a glance see the representation or underrepresentation of students within these groups. So we're not moving fast enough uh, to reach the missing millions in STEM, although it's encouraging to see more students studying science and engineering overall over the last decade. So I'm done with the slides, thank you. I want to extend many thanks to NCSES for the preparation of these reports and to all of you who have reviewed sometimes more than once <laughs> these reports for their content. Releases for the 2024 cycle will continue for the next several months, including the March 15th delivery of the State of US Science and Engineering to the White House and to Congress, so the summary report. Uh, early next year, the board will also consider this cycle's uh, policy messaging to accompany that delivery, the, the summary report, which will be focused on developing STEM talent. 
SCB has also been continuing to work uh, towards uh, the sort of revising our vision of indicators for the 2026 cycle, as discussed at the last meeting and over the summer, with the three pillars that we're exploring being uh, streamlined thematic reports, so three reports on talent, discoveries, and translation, uh, and a similarly framed uh, summary report. Secondly, uh, enhanced data dashboard that preserves the current indicators breadth and depth so that we're not going to lose information. And we will, of course, uh, take input from all of you on how well our, our plans are meeting that goal. And a quick turnaround mechanism for analysis of special topics of high relevance. So being able to have data online as it accumulates will make us much more nimble in our ability to respond to any trends that we're observing in that data. So we look forward to updating the board on our progress on the future indicators vision uh, in more detail at our next meeting. So the final two things I'd like to use my time for are to turn it over to, to the SEP policy teams. I'll first turn to Marvie, who leads the national security team. Marvie. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks also to my fellow national security policy scoping team members. Um, those are Suresh Babu, Dorora, and Julia. Um, so as a quick reminder, our team has two focus areas. Foreign-born talent, especially in the context of uh, critical technology areas, and science and engineering and national security broadly. Today, I will update um, you on the first topic, foreign-born STEM talent, and two key points that we are exploring. First um, is the U.S. reliance on foreign-born STEM talent, especially students from China and India, and especially in STEM fields important to U.S. national security. Students from India and China who drive the overall trends for international science and engineering graduate student enrollment in the United States are heavily concentrated in computer and information sciences and in engineering. Second, warning signs that the U.S. ability to attract STEM talent at the enrollment entry point is ebbing. For example, from 2016 to 2020, the number of international students decreased in the United States. International enrollment increased in all other top countries of destination. The U.S. hosted 15% of all international students worldwide in 2020, down from 17% in 2010 and 23% in 2000. We're also developing policy recommendations for future consideration by the Science and Engineering Policy Committee and the full board with plans for a fuller discussion at the next board meeting. Their current draft form is moving towards increasing U.S. capacity to retain international STEM talent, diversifying international STEM talent pool, basically the overall pool, and developing the data analytics capacity to better understand and meet workforce needs related to critical and emerging technologies. As always, our team will align our work with the science and engineering policy talent team, with the external engagement committee strategies, and with the indicators cycle. Um, do my, my fellow policy team members have anything to add? Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. With that, uh, we welcome any comments and discussions and ideas from the board. Well, thank you so much. We'll we'll take questions at the end, sort of on the, the whole picture. Um, I'd like to turn over the time to Julia. Right. Uh, thanks so much, Maureen. Um, and uh, as is become apparent in the last number of board um, engagements, uh, the talent, uh, STEM talent, is a pressing issue. It, shows up very clearly in our Vision 2030 document, and the board has increasingly become engaged in it, um, and the talent development team is working along several prongs in that direction. Um, in the last, at, in the, at the August meeting, uh, we gave you sort of some very general, uh, perhaps vague um, mm -hmm. indications of where we are moving. We're now moving into the implementation phase, 
And because we identified a number of topics that, um, and it's just not possible to pursue them all simultaneously, we are focusing on a couple of them right now. Um, before I get into that, though, I really need to thank the um, talent development team members. Uh, it's actually a pretty good fraction of this board, which shows how <laughs> important everybody thinks this is. Uh, we have uh, Vic, um, Suresh Babu, Bev, Deborah, Kayvon, Marvi, Vicky, and Matt. So um, really a very nice cross-section of the board, and it's wonderful to be working with all of you. I'd also like to emphasize how important our partnership is with James Moore in EDU. We heard from him earlier, and I drew him out just a little bit on community colleges because that's one of the first couple of areas we're focusing on. But his part, uh, the partnership of James and the EDU directorate it, um, will be incredibly important as we move forward. Um, we. Um, our, we were charged with scoping out potential focus areas and products that could be developed into policy pieces and recommendations around the vision pillar um, of talent development, uh, tw vision 2030 pillar of talent development. Um, we were also highly energized by our site visits um, during the um, board retreat in Kentucky and ongoing discussions about the talent development crisis that faces our nation almost anywhere that you look from national security to economic prosperity, et cetera. Um, so we're working on several aspects of, STEM of the STEM talent braided river, basically looking at the whole stream from pre-K to the workforce and the deep dives I'm gonna start talking about um, are um, you know, the first, first couple of those streams, the braided, whole braided river we envision as sort of the final output of, of the team. Emphasizing this is early stages, so while we are happy to talk in generalities, getting terribly specific is going to be difficult. Um, one thing, one of the two areas we really focused on is um, financial hurdles for undergraduate STEM education. You will recall that there was a one pager previously released, a couple of couple of related documents on the financial hurdle, hurdles faced by the graduate population. As a board, we gravitate naturally in that direction because you know most of us went through the, the graduate school pipeline and that's the one that we interact with most closely in, um, in our interactions with academia. But you have to get through the undergraduate hurdle to get to the graduate, um, to, to the opportunity for graduate education. And so um, Beverly is um, leading the team that is subgroup that is exploring those financial hur hurdles. There have been two meetings, and we and um, huge kudos to the um, board office staff as well as um, Mike and Andrew who are helping with identify possible data sources for us uh, for this as well as the other efforts we're going through. Um, so some of the things that we are pulling data for include readiness. For example, what percentage of students are prepared to finish requirements for a STEM degree in four years or less? Um, for example, engineering students. How many entering engineering students have already are not positioned to be able to take calculus in their first year at university? That already puts them behind the eight ball. Um, so some of what James said earlier um, is relevant to that with community colleges. Financial aid about the magnitude of debt load for Pell recipients disaggregated by field of study as well as demographic identifiers. Um, debt and the kinds of debt that different groups of students graduating with a STEM degree carry um, and, and correlation between student debt and number of hours worked during the school year, all of which can affect time to degree as well as success in actually achieving that degree. Um, we're, we're looking at co-ops and internships those potentially can bring in money for undergraduates um, and be a gateway for graduate school admissions. Um, how many opportunities are there? What's their distribution? Who is actually taking advantage of those uh, opportunities and what can we learn from that? And finally, we are uh, very interested in exploring service for education programs where college costs may be defrayed by service after graduation. 
We're, um, and we're exploring current programs and funding sources, particularly those that might be formed with private partnerships. Um, that seems very appealing, but we need to know more before we, um, before, before we can wholeheartedly endorse that. So brief update on, under, on the undergraduate um, issues uh, having to do with affordability. A second area of focus, as I sort of foreshadowed in my question to James, is around community colleges. Um, we've identified that as sort of a nexus where lots of different issues come together. Um, we witnessed uh, some of the remarkable contributions of community colleges during our retreat in Kentucky. Um, Somerset Community College um, in Appalachia um, is doing the best of what community colleges do educating pre-K through 12th grade STEM teachers, providing partnerships between students and local businesses, conducting innovative research, and training, training the skilled technical workforce and providing an entry point for students into four-year colleges and universities. So pretty much that nexus that I'm talking about. And this community college and the network um, of community colleges to which it connects is not unique. Um, the board has heard time and again how community colleges are, um, are a major node in the STEM educational network, and they can be leveraged to dramatically impact the STEM talent crisis we're facing. Um, so Vicki Chandler um, has a, a tremendous amount of passion around community colleges, and so we're very fortunate that she's leading our, the team that is um, looking at the community colleges. We are just starting to look at data and um, again, we have, thanks to uh, the great efforts of the board office, um, we already have a start at, at looking at some of these data. Uh, for example, who is served geographically by community colleges? There is the assertion that there, um, almost everybody is close to a community college. And yet, if you look at Nevada, it's hard to believe. I mean, the, you know, <laughs> there are 500 miles between um, parts of Nevada and the nearest community college. So, so it's clearly not quite universal there. What are the demographic student characteristics of the community college students? Not only by kind of the usual standards of uh, uh, de demographic axes, but also socioeconomic status, age, family status, and other other important variables. What is the spe field-specific distribution of certificates and associate degrees awarded? And can we increase that, those that impact critical technology areas? Right. Um, what are the trajectories of students who attend community colleges? Do they enter the skilled technical workforce? Do they transfer to a four-year institution? What other paths do they take? Um, what is the cost of um, attendance? Some states have very low uh, low cost entry to community colleges, maybe even free for um, for some students, um, whereas others do not. And <laughs> finally, what are the matric matriculation agreements and transfer issues regarding transferability of credits between community colleges and universities? So those are some of the things that we are starting to look at in that space. So. Obviously, we're already very busy doing deep dives in these couple of areas, um, but other subgroups are starting to form as well. One is skilled technical workforce, something we've been working on for years, um, and, but incredibly important. And that group is led by Vic. Um, we have the pre-K through 12th grade subgroup, which will be working on expanding and supporting the instructional workforce and they're directly picking up on some of the recommendations from the ESCI um, group. So as you can see, we are pushing full steam ahead to develop policy pieces for SEP around topics essential to the board's work. We're working on deliverables to amplify messaging in alignment with um, the SEP national security team that Marvi just talked about, um, external engagement committee strategies, as well as the indicator cycle. And so I think you will see a lot of um, synergy between those different efforts as we move forward. Um, so uh, team members, do you have anything to add at this point? Okay, great. And so we welcome um, any comments, discussion, ideas from the board. Um, and we are, there are those efforts that we are still nascent. So if anybody else wants to join us, you're more than welcome. Are there any quick questions? The emphasis on the word quick. <laughs> yeah. 
All right. See, can, yes. Can I ask one quick question? So I, I am not at all surprised to hear that any group that you're leading is proceeding full speed ahead. Um, I did want to ask, um, are you looking at all at, at sort of retention rates, dropout rates, both from community college and also in career paths that, that students enter into? I mean, are we retaining people who go through the CC routes? Um, that is certainly something that is very interesting to us. And I mean, I think what we'd already identified, though I didn't actually speak to it, is actually the retention rate for the community college students, how many exit with the certification or the degree that they embark upon um, and in the area in which they start embarking. Um, so uh, so that clearly is already on our radar screen. Staying in career, that's a highly interesting thing. And I think that will really start to come to the fore as we think about the Braided River concept because we, that, we do envision going all the way from pre-K through to the workforce. All right. Thank you, Maureen, Marvi, uh, and Julia. Uh, we're uh, going to turn to the next item on the agenda, which is an update uh, from NSF on SAFR. Um, and uh, Ponch is going to kick it off. Uh, as you know, this has been an intense focus of conversation uh, uh, across the board uh, in both open and closed sessions since we first received the alarming SAFR report. It's also a particularly important time uh, to hear an update because we're, for the first time, going to be able to send board members to the ice, uh, the first time since uh, uh, before the pandemic in, uh, in December of 2019. And so we'll have a firsthand opportunity to engage, uh, but also, uh, as we know, the, the House Science Committee uh, has sent uh, a series of questions to NSF uh, to understand its response to uh, uh, to the situation that's been revealed. And we'll have more opportunities for conversation about this uh, in closed session later today. Um, but I will uh, I'll start by handing the floor over to Ponch to give us an update on the progress that that has been made. Ponch. Thank you, Dan, and um, good afternoon to all of you. I, I really thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on our progress so far on sexual assault harassment prevention and response, we call it SAPR in Antarctica. Um, our Chief Operations Officer, Karen Maranjal, returned from the ICE last week and got and uh, returned with COVID uh, after, she got, after she got back. So she's therefore joining us virtually. And then we also have um, our uh, special assistant that has recently joined uh, for SAPR in my office. Uh, Renee Ferranti, and I will introduce her later as we come to the point where Renee is going to make some remarks also. Before I begin today, I just want to make sure that I, you know, reiterate one more time, but I will keep doing this because it's so important that addressing the issues of sexual violence, sexual assault, assault and harassment is one of the most important issues that I am addressing as a director of the National Science Foundation. I want to make clear our position and what guides all our efforts, whether in Antarctica or in other locations where NSF-supported activities are conducted. First, we recognize that to enable scientists, engineers, and students to work at the outermost frontiers of knowledge, the agency must be a role model for teamwork, fairness, and equity. Investing in science, technology, engineering, and education for the nation's future necessitates a safe environment free from any form of harassment that fosters equal opportunity for all. NSF and I are deeply committed to creating a safe and inclusive research environment where everyone and their work can thrive. I can assure you that every single member of my leadership team is as committed, if not more as I am, to create a culture of scientific excellence where every individual feels a sense of safety and security. I just want to put this all in perspective, particularly for some of the new members, this might be useful, this timeline. Over the last year, we have periodically shared with the board the initial steps we have taken to address the immediate needs of our colleagues in Antarctica 
and the broader community. Let me just briefly give you a recap so that we are all on the same page, literally. First, in 2018, the National Academy released its NSF-sponsored report on sexual harassment in academia. As an agency, we responded immediately with policy changes and resources for the community. We are currently working with the agency partners, I mentioned this in my comments this morning, to conduct a follow-on study. Next. It was after this study was released that NSF received input from the USAP community in 2020 regarding their concerns on the work and research environment in Antarctica. That was the genesis of the SAPA report, which NSF commissioned in 2021. In June 2022, SAFR report was released and shared with the public and the board. I took three actions that were initiated immediately afterwards in September 2022. One, initiated a SAPR program office to serve as a single point of focus for the agency. Issued an action plan for Antarctica. Established the SAFR task force who were tasked with carrying out the action plan. The action plan was implemented through a series of activities over the next year, just in the last 12 months. If you remember last year, about, about this time, we were also dealing with a major issue, which is the major surge of COVID cases in Antarctica. We were also experiencing delays in our supply chain to support the USAP. Despite these challenges, I prioritized SAPR actions, and we were able to complete all the action plan items by the end of the season. As you know, the seasons are not long, right? The summer seasons, as you all can appreciate. The following things were done. The on-ice advocate was deployed to Antarctica in October 2022. So there is a neutral party that people can go to without feeling any sense of reservation that, you know, uh, and we can talk about these things later too. Listening sessions, because we want to understand from people on the ground, what can we do to be of help to ensure their feeling of safety and security. Listening sessions with those on the eyes were held from December 2022 to February 2023, and we will say more about that shortly. We, we launched Safer Science at NSF.gov, a single reporting line for the NSF community in January 2023. In February 2023, all the physical safety upgrades were completed, and we reported to you about them, and uh, thanks for your um, you know, cooperation and, and, and ideas. In April 2023, the NSF Antarctic Helpline, as we went into the winter season, which supplements, which supplements the advocate, counselor, cha chaplain, and marshal was added as an additional resource for the community. Aside from these changes, we also instituted other safety, security, and policy measures. The community asked us, for more information on resources. So we issued an anti-retaliation resource in December 2022. We updated the station and vessel internet pages to provide software specific information also in December 2022. This was accompanied by a coordinated campaign in all the public and private spaces in Antarctica regarding the available resources. Later this year, we provided also a flowchart on for USAP on reporting actions so that there is no confusion. Throughout the last year, over 60 bystander training sessions covering 2,500 individuals have been conducted. These are the same sessions that Kevan, Beverly, and Aaron recently attended. There are other actions we have taken over the last year, which I have not mentioned in the interest of time. I want to acknowledge that these steps represent the initial actions. I underscore initial actions we have taken. They are only the beginning of a longer process. Let's talk about the Antarctic support contract and the NSF expectations. In parallel to ordering, ensuring safety, security, we also wanted to make sure that we, that we are ensuring that the, the Antarctic support contract you know, delivered what it is supposed to deliver. 
So we looked at every lever we had available in the Antarctic support contract to effect change. Our first goal was to ensure that our contractor understood our expectations. First and foremost, the contractor must adhere to the codes of business ethics and integrity that is part of the federal acquisition regulation. In our first communication with Lidos, after the SAFR report was released, we reiterated this expectation. At the time I met with the CEO, then CEO. We also ensured that the contractor must communicate and report on all of their policies and practices on sexual violence, and that included subcontractors. Third, they needed to provide us with documentation that such procedures were in place. Finally, we expected that any new policies and practices that NSF issued will flow down to all the subcontractors. After the SAFR report was released, we began with an initial communication and followed up with specific contract modifications over the last year. There are several of them. In between each of these modifications, we reaffirmed our expectations, ensured that the contractor was following through, and if they did not, we would issue corrective guidance and any additional modifications as necessary. Closer coordination happens not only through formal contractual mechanisms, but also in other ways. Just yesterday, I met with the new CEO, Tom Bell, their head of HR, and the president of the division that is going to oversee this Antarctic contract. I met with all three of them yesterday in my office. In my meeting with him, I reinforced the expectations I have laid out to you and emphasized my focus on the need to adhere not only to the letter of the contract terms, but the higher principles that I have articulated. That implies not only, applies not only to Lidos, but to their subcontractors as well. Mr. Bell confirmed that he has that same expectation and intends to aggressively pursue these goals, is its words. I will be meeting monthly with Mr. Bell moving forward. I've told him that I need to meet with him monthly, and he has also said that he's going to do the same with the subcontractors himself and keep us all in the right focus, moving forward, doing the things that we promised to do. But our engagement with Lidos will be a layered approach. In addition to my monthly meetings with the CEO, Karen, our COO, meets with her counterpart, our chief acquisition officer, and our programmatic staff will also continue their regular engagements with their counterparts at Lidos because I want it to be at all levels. In this way, we can ensure both formal and informal mechanisms are put together for a tight coordination and oversight of the Antarctic support contract. As I said, we have had many listening sessions with the community. What is the data on that? There are seven in-person listening sessions in Antarctica from October to November 2022 with 160 participants. Soon after, despite the COVID, we were on the ice right away conducting these listening sessions. Six virtual listening sessions on top of that from December 2022 to February 2023. 74 participants, including former USAP community members. Special sessions for Palmer, Vessels, Survivors, South Pole, Early Career, USAP in general. Now you may ask, what were the listening sessions about? What were the themes? And how are we moving forward with each one of them? And I'm going to go through each one of those, what we have done as follow-up actions, and what are the planned future actions. And I'm going to ask Karen, who has been coordinating this with me, to take over and talk about each one of them. Thank you, Panch. Um, so I'm going to go through um, several slides that uh, that generated as Punch, uh, Punch described from the listening sessions and helped to inform our plans of action over this past year. Um, one of the themes that we heard last year and we continue to hear are concerns about retaliation. Fear of organizational retaliation, such as not being offered a job in a subsequent season, getting passed over for a promotion, um, any of those types of actions as a result of reporting. Um, and then there is also social retaliation, being socially isolated or being improperly blamed for a policy change 
as a result of, of, of reporting. Uh, this could be reporting of sexual harassment or assault or other types of reporting, for example, concerns about workplace safety or work conditions. We have taken some initial steps that you see here on the slide to impress that retaliation is not only illegal, but it has no place in our workplace. And we know that we have more work to do as we learn more about uh, the impact of retaliation. Uh, when we hear more about instances of retaliation, uh, we are continuing to double down on our efforts and change our processes moving forward in order to address those concerns. So what have we done? What have we already put into place? The, uh, the prime contract was modified as Ponch described to clarify the scope of required reporting to NSF on contractor investigations of sexual misconduct. And this includes uh, any instances of perceived or real retaliation. Information about where to report retaliation, complaints about retaliation were sent to all of the USAP participants and reminders that retaliation is prohibited. We included social retaliation scenarios to the bystander intervention training, and that is a training that all uh, USAP participants, including visitors, take before they are allowed to deploy to the ICE. Um, and we've now focused discussion uh, with our new Lido CEO, as you just heard Ponch mention, on ensuring total cooperation of all aspects of reporting, and importantly, ensuring that we are chasing down any claims of retaliation and following up on them. As I said, we have more work to do, especially in this area. In addition to the monthly meetings that Ponch will be holding with the new Lido CEO, um, we now have a new senior HR representative from the Antarctic support contract that will be on the ice. And that person uh, will coordinate HR functions for the subcontractors and will focus on ensuring, ensuring compliance with our retaliation policies, which again, uh, there is a no tolerance for re retaliation. We also know that we need to explore more training for supervisors and employees around retaliation, defining what it is, um, educating both supervisors and employees and empowering both of them uh, to understand and take action where necessary around retaliation. So I wanna underscore that we are in learning mode here and we continue to, as we continue to learn about the instances and impacts of retaliation, this will continue to be a central part of our focus as we move into future seasons. Next slide, please. Another theme that we heard uh, from our listening sessions last year was uh, to increase the quality of reporting mechanisms. And we have worked diligently over the past year to ensure that a range of reporting mechanisms exist so that anyone in the USAP community knows how to reach the type of support that they need. Much of what we implemented over the past year came directly from suggestions from USAP members, um, particularly during those listening sessions. What we have already implemented um, are a variety of new mechanisms. We now have the on-ice confidential victim advocate who's deployed during the summer season and virtual during the winter season. And in fact, when I was uh, down on the ice last week, the advocate was, was at the South Pole. So the advocate is uh, is not just stationed at, at McMurdo, but also visiting all of the stations um, to, to make herself available to employees, um, USAP employees and participants. We have the 24-7 hotline for USAP participants. They, that is available using phone, text, and online chat. Um, and we have the new requirement that all field stations are equipped with at least two satellite phones to help ensure that anyone in a field station would have access to a communication device uh, and to guard against uh, the, the types of isolation that may happen uh, in, at those field stations. We also are pilot this year increased communication access with Starlink. Um, and so that is now available uh, at McMurdo Station. Also, another way to address the potential isolation um, and allow more seamless communication uh, beyond the continent. 
future? What are we planning for subsequent seasons? Uh, we know now that we have these various mechanisms in place, it's incumbent upon us to communicate these efforts to the USAP community and also to communicate the differences between the varieties of these, of, of these resources. Um, and to ensure that folks not only know that they exist, but which is the correct one to, um, to go to in, in a case of need. Um, we are also continuing to, it, to streamline the reporting for individuals who experience sexual violence uh, on the ice. Uh, so those are some of the measures that we are looking at um, and putting in place as we move forward. Next slide, please. Uh, the next theme that came out of the listening sessions was um, for us to strengthen the systems that hold perpetrators accountable. And again, we have uh, we have some actions that we put into place already um, and some things that we're looking ahead. Um, we now have points of contact in place at the federal military and, 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 our, and Arctic support contract partners to ensure accountability mechanisms for the resolution of sexual misconduct complaints. Uh, we have seen, for instance, over this past year at Lidos, important personnel changes in the project director, in the business operations and controls lead, and in the large project controls director. Uh, these three very important positions that span leadership and um, on-site operations and management have completely turned over in the past year as a result of our connection, our close collaboration with Lidos. Um, I have also been able to use uh, my contact with the Lido COO to immediately pick up the phone and um, and run down uh, if there were questions, concerns about specific issues that were arising. Uh, so both the director and I and our program staff have had these immediate points of contact that we are able to uh, to um, to use at a moment's notice. We um, be moving beyond the continent because this work involves field stations, not only in Antarctica, uh, but in anywhere that we do science around the world. We now, as of this past year, require organizations uh, who, who are applying for NSF funding to certify a field safety plan for those pro proposals that involve field work. We are also this year piloting um, having individual PIs submit field safety plans that they are responsible for in addition to their institutions as part of the merit review process. And we're piloting this in, um, in programs both in GEO and in BIO. We're continuing to review that pilot to understand how we then move to a more broad scale implementation. As we look to the future, we continue, we have a, a process of continual monitoring and modification of contract provisions to ensure that accountability is where we want it to be and to make those modifications if it's not. Um, and importantly, we continue to collaborate with our colleagues in the Office of the Inspector General on their recommendations, which you heard about at the last meeting, uh, to solidify and, and flesh out what their presence and role in Antarctica is going to be. We have a tiger team of NSF and, and OIG staff who are making re recommendations to, uh, to Allison and myself for what the OIG presence will look like um, in the next season and moving forward. Next slide, please. We also heard from the listening sessions um, the need to address privacy and safety concerns. Uh, and so in addition this season, in addition to the additional satellite phones for field teams, contact cards were created to accompany the satellite phones with critical phone numbers, for example, the victim's advocate. This is a way that we know there is a physical manifestation of those resources that goes along with the people, with the communication devices, uh, so that someone does not have to think about remembering where to find a phone number, remembering who they need to contact. It's there, it's in plain sight. Uh, we also uh, have enhanced screening procedures for employment on the ICE. Um, and uh, this, this involves taking USAP participants through the same screening level that we would as an NSF employee. Um, as we look to future seasons, uh, we are um, we will be deploying additional uh, NSF staff and SAFR support uh, for station for at McMurdo Station, but also on the stations beyond McMurdo at South Pole and Palmer, um, and at the research vessels and field sites. Um, 
And so we uh, we will continue to do that. We are also needing to continue to balance the enhanced background checking with the timeliness of the background process. And our CORF is investigating external vetting possibilities um, that we can use to smooth those processes, yet keep the high standards uh, that we expect out of our vetting. Next slide, please. Uh, we also heard from the listening sessions that it is imperative to engage USAP community members in the SAPR efforts and improve communication with partners. And we have done quite a bit in this realm. Um, we, I have now seen, because I was down there, uh, the implementation of the SAFR resources, which are clearly available across all the stations. I saw this firsthand in the galley, in the restrooms, in the dorms, um, on walls that are, they are prominently located on video screens. Uh, th this information is, uh, has been very, very clearly communicated. We heard feedback from participants there that they appreciate the presence of that information. Um, we have included SAFR information to the landing page of the McMurdo internet um, and resources, resource information has, has been directly emailed to all USAP participants. We established, as you know, the Safer Science at NSF.gov website, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, email address, and we continually monitor that. Our staff in OECR monitor that. Um, and bystander intervention training is required for all USAP participants. Um, this, this I experienced as a, um, as, as a deployer this year, um, and we involved some special training uh, for bartenders at McMurdo. Um, we uh, are still awaiting approval uh, clearance from OMB, but we will be uh, implementing our first climate survey um, as soon as we get that clearance. And that is something that we will administer on an annual basis, as I've reported to you previously, to ensure that we continue to hear from community members about the impact of these efforts um, and changes that we need to make. And next slide, which will be... Um, my, my final one. Um, the last recommendation was to provide additional SAPR prevention and response training for supervisors, PIs, um, as well as community members. So this was the recommendation that we start to, um, we start to have trainings that are specific to the different job types. Um, so we have, um, we have provided materials for managers um, and supervisors to incorporate into their regular staff meetings. During my um, bystander intervention training, uh, I heard from managers there who described the ways that they were using these types of materials in their staff meetings. So this is, this is being implemented. Um, there were um, in-person bystander intervention conversations that took place across different work centers at McMurdo, um, and the victim's advocate participated in regular staff meetings, was invited to participate in regular staff meetings to promote awareness of the resources. We, of course, are going to continue to update the training materials based on the critical feedback that we receive from USAP, USAP community members, and as we continue to uh, collaborate with experts in the field and learn more about the most up-to-date research, we will also be incorporating that into training materials moving forward. And with that, uh, Ponch, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Karen. And uh, in a moment, we want to share with you some of what we are doing to help individuals who have experienced sexual violence understand the channels they have available for reporting. Before I do that, I'm so pleased to introduce now Rene Franti. Rene will be serving as a special assistant for SAPR implementation within the office of the director. She comes to us from the Peace Corps where she was the director of SAPR program. She brings more than 25 years of experience working in the field of sexual violence at multiple agencies, including the Department of Defense. We are incredibly fortunate in having Rene whose expertise spans from being an expert in providing frontline support for survivors to writing and implementing policy at an agency level. I hope you will get to know her better and also rely on her as a resource as I do. As we have discussed with you at the previous board meetings, 
While our initial focus for the SAFAR action plan was on Antarctica, we are now moving into a broader implementation phase that goes beyond our responsibilities for the U.S. Antarctic program. Mr. Ferranti will role will coordinate the offices and directorates responsible for agency SAFAR implementation to ensure a unified agency approach. Welcome, Rene. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me today. Um, we are just going to, I'll share a little bit in an example of one of the responsive ways we're trying to take some action to ensure that community members have a clear mechanism or means to uh, uh, understand the reporting options and available resources to them. So on this chart, it's just showing you a flow chart as one tool in the toolbox of the many, many efforts that have been made by NSF that Karen and the director have mentioned um, just previously. I wanna share just a couple of things um, and my goals and my thoughts about joining this organization. And mind you, it's not been quite two weeks, just about uh, including the Thanksgiving holidays. So I am learning a lot and I'm very excited to be here. Um, but I will tell you that in the many years I've done this work in nonprofit, uh, law enforcement, municipal, federal government, um, it's not, it's never done. And we have to constantly evolve with the work, uh, you know, to learn and to do better. Everything we do is going to evolve and, and we'll learn from what's working and keep moving. Um, and I will say that, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation if any organization had the fix, unfortunately. And I never would have thought I'd still be doing this work more than 25 years later. Um, so I just want to share that although NSF is a very unique population, unique agency with a unique population, um, that's not unique to this work. Unfortunately, trauma and sexual violence impacts everyone, regardless of who you are, where you are, where you live. Um, I stood up a program for the Defense Logistics Agency that involved, they're not directly tied to a service branch. So they don't fall under what a traditional DOD, oh, everyone's on a, a base they have all those inherent services. They were 25,000 civilians, 3,000 contractors, 3,000 service members from all branches of service, host country nationals, in 583 different locations around the world. Um, that's a challenge, right? Coming from Peace Corps, uh, we, had, we were in 65 different countries with 7,000 volunteers embedded in the middle of nowhere, often with very poor communications. Um, side by side with host country nationals in many countries where sexual assault isn't even identified officially as a crime per se, or certainly not identified or defined the same way we do. So there's a lot of challenges with this work everywhere. Um, so I just, I'm honored to be here to help shepherd this along and excited with the work that's already been done. Um, and just really trying to make this a more comprehensive NSF-wide program while USAP and, and the Polar programs are obviously critical. It's such a unique environment. I do want to say that, you know, this isn't isolated to individuals in that one location. So having a broader NSF approach will just, I think, help everyone moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rene. You've been a tremendous asset, uh, and already we have made significant progress, even though she said two weeks. Uh, her two weeks is like several months, I think, because of her past experience and expertise. She just comes in and hits the ground running, so thank you so much. Um, I know that we are running out of time, so I think Dan has been looking at me for a few minutes now. <laughs> so uh, I, I wanted Karen to actually sh share her first-hand experiences having just returned from the ice, but if you all prefer that we keep the schedule, Dan, we can do this in the closed sessions if that's okay with you. Uh, it's entirely your, cho your call, Dan, because I didn't want to abuse your, your clock here. Well, we have some external speakers and I'm sensitive to yes. their time as yes. well. I suggest we, we continue yeah. the conversation okay. in the closed Great. session. Great. So, Thank you, Dan. Appreciate thank that. You. Yeah. Thank you all. All right. This is going to bring us to a break for lunch. And so I'll just ask that the, the recording stop. I just want to offer a quick comment before we do that. So we're going to have an uh, here's how lunch is going to work. First of all, you don't get any lunch.